that that's the hardest part of it is is there's these people that are fighting against ai online and you'd think they'd be our allies like they think i think they think they're our allies but they're not because all they want to do is cause strife they just want to go on the comment threads and cause shit. and so yeah. the first thing that happens is oceana posts it and i'm like cool man i've been waiting for like a year for this hope people like it i still read the comments i'm an idiot and so I, I looked at the comments, people were licking it. Oh, this is awesome. And then of course, th th then they start. Like, I'm like, just don't reply. I was, obviously, don't reply. It's stupid. Oceanos, they're good, they're good people. And, and, and they started replying. They started being like, dude, like, no, like, not even, no, Dusty's been our artist since like 2010. So, I mean, that's like a whole decade before AI even existed. So you're not going to, you're not going to make those accusations. Then they just, Hey, how's it going? You are here for Heavy Art Talk, and as usual, it's your host, Lee. I am very pumped. I have Dusty Peterson joining me today on Instagram. He goes by Croaking Demon. Uh, his work is extremely versatile, and he also has expertise in like 3D type software, and he uses as part of his painting technique uh, for certain approaches. So I'm definitely excited to talk about that, amongst a ton of other things. But he's been in the industry for a long time. A couple bands that he's worked with would be Oceano, Unleash the Archers, Hoth, Six Feet Under, and Bloodbath. But without further ado, Dusty, how's it going, man? Hey, how's it going, me? How's it going? It's going great, dude. Very excited to have you on. Uh, been a fan of your work for quite some time, and you thank know, we've you. Been online friends, so it's good to like meet you in the flesh. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Or at least as flesh as this gets, you know what I mean? But it's definitely oh, another this, level This is as fleshy as we need it to be. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, man. Uh, well, just kind of starting out, what have you been listening to lately? Oh, man, I, I got to be honest. Like This year, I'm still absolutely dominated by Invincible Shield. Like uh, yeah. Judas Priest is my all-time favorite band. I've been a fan of, uh, of, of... I mean, basically, it's really a love, love of Rob Halford uh, when, you know, he left the band and uh, Ripper Owens joined. I didn't really listen in those years, and there's nothing wrong with those albums. I just didn't listen to them. Um, but when he when he did when he did solo stuff like Resurrection and and Crucible, I was so on board with those, and I, I was really excited about seeing where his like solo trajectory was going to be because I really like you know fight and all that kind of stuff too. Yeah. And so I loved all the reunion stuff, but I've been I feel like I've been waiting for this album. Like, it's just i i hesitate to say because i know some people are like what but i mean for me it, it's honestly it's a perfect album there, there's not a single song on the album i dislike and the, it's the, the, the first three songs alone leave me in my car head banging like crazy and i just i, don't know, I can't get enough of it like I, i'm probably behind on some albums this year just because i've been cranking that one so much <laughs> yeah totally man i have not given that album enough time I'll oh. safely say that I, I do like firepower and I think that was just yeah. like the right time for me. Uh, just lately I haven't been in like a giant Judas priest mood. So I think it's just one of those things that I got to like yeah. be in the mood, but everything I heard, I liked good production um, where they went with Andy Sneap. If I'm not... Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. kind of filling in for, uh, yeah, for Glenn Tipton too. So it's, yeah, cause I mean, he was no. playing live with them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen him twice with uh, Andy and it was great both times. So unfortunately, I, I haven't gotten to see, you know, they, you know, when, when he can, they bring out Glenn Tipton to, uh, you know, play like some the of the ones stuff. that he can play. Yeah, the encores and stuff. I haven't, I haven't gotten lucky to see him uh, yet, but uh, Andy's doing awesome, as far as I can tell. Sick. Uh, what would you say, like, are your top five favorite Judas Priest albums then, just like Ooh, off the cuff, yeah. which I know can Ooh. shift all the time. Yeah, it does. I mean, you know how it is. But yeah, I, I mean, number one is easily Screaming for Vengeance. That was the first album that I listened to from them. And I can still, I can close my eyes and it's like crystal clear HD. I can picture first time I heard, you know, the intro to the Hellion that leads into Electric Eye. Yeah. Can't, cannot beat those memories. I, I will often try to revisit those lo locations that, that I, I listened to that album in uh, just to recreate that feeling of, of hearing that monstrous fucking album for the first time um second would be defenders of the faith 
that's just i mean it's it, uh, those are kind of those, those two albums kind of they're almost like sister albums in a way they, they got the same kind of like style and vibe you know it's like Our i don't know it's consistent too. yeah yeah it's a, it, but they were making albums like once a year at that point yeah if you look at the t- the dates it's like it's like it's like 77 78 79 80 81. it's like every year they were making albums and stuff so i, I think you just ended up in that kind of like creative block where they all kind of had that same flow going um for a third one let's see gosh th- th- this is where you start splitting hairs a little bit you'd think i'd say british steel but honestly it's honestly not one of my absolute top ones i uh so for the third one i'd have to go with uh painkiller yeah then below that would be sad wings of destiny and then after that i would have to go with probably british steel Nice. That's a yeah. perfect run right there, man. Yeah, I think I, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would agree on pretty much all those. My list would be very similar. I might have stained class in there and substitute yeah. something out, but that would be probably the only edit I would have. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Like I, I, I it's like I said, that, at that point, it's splitting hairs like on some of those because it's like, you know, depending on what kind of day it is outside, I might be like, oh, <laughs> you know, this one, it's a perfect sunny day. I need this or if it's a rainy day i need that i don't know you know i'm, I'm that kind of i'm that kind of listener <laughs> so uh, same man um when it comes to like metal music just in general like how did you kind of fall in love with it like when did it all begin for you so i can definitely say that when i was young and, and when i mean young i mean young young like six or seven you know mtv was in full force so people bag on, you know, the glam metal era or whatever. That's fine. Like, but I mean, that's, that's exactly the kind of, you know, entrance into this kind of music that happened back then. I mean, everyone watched MTV. Everyone had immediate access to just tons of new music coming out. And while, you know, they weren't exactly, uh, you know, playing, you know, I don't know, Saxon or something, you know, they, they're, they're playing like stuff on there. I mean, Guns N' Roses, while in my opinion, that's full blown rock, like that's that's still getting darker and heavier compared to you know Poison or whatever. Uh, so, but I mean, if if if, if, if that's like the, the early early stages, then I'd say my my actual gateway band would have either been Megadeth with Countdown to Extinction, or jump forward a couple more years and go Ministry Psalm sixty nine. Mm. Okay. Because that's industrial, but it's, I mean, that's a heavy fucking album. I mean, it really, really is. And, I, and honestly, Ministry's never matched that one for me. I, I like some of their, you know, here and there's, but I mean, that, that album was heavy as hell. And then it was uh, a couple more years later, it was moving to Seattle to go to art school. And my, he's still, he's still my best friend, uh, but I, I met, back then he was my roommate. Uh, I remember he came in and I was, I'm pretty sure, dude, I'm not even lying. I was, I'm pretty sure I was listening to like Goo Goo Dolls or some shit, man. Like at first, at first album, or maybe it's the second, I don't know, but a boy named Goo, it's, it's got some good rockers on there, man. And you know, back, back in, back when Aren't I was they 16. with Cannibal cool. Corpse or something? Dude, because they were on Metal Blade, right? Yeah, yeah, so, so they were actually, briefly. Yeah. So that was like my first like introduction to what Metal Blade was. And I remember him making fun of me. He was like, what the hell you listen to, dude? I'm like, hey, it's just, I don't know. It's just some rock, dude. He's like, man, like, I, I heard you at least listen to some Marilyn Manson the other day. Like, can you at least listen to some more shit like that? I'm like, I guess. I mean, yeah, sure. So I put that on. He's like, I mean, well, if you like the heavy stuff, I got some heavy stuff for you. I was like, what? And he actually put on Rotting oh, Christ. Nice. That's Triarchy a big jump. Lost Lovers. And that was like, it changed my freaking world. That I was like, I never heard any music like that in my entire life. Everything was what the radio stations decided to play. Mm-hmm. everything in fact i do remember going into a you know again i'm old so blockbuster music this is, you know, this is a long time ago where you could listen to stuff if you just hand them the cd they'd let you listen to it uh and i remember seeing some cannibal corpse album covers and i knew them because i knew vince Locke because he did uh some comic books that i was reading at the time called dead world yep and so i was like oh cool vince Locke, this is awesome but i never listened to it and so, but by the time I, I got to meet my buddy, then, you know, I found out he had all the Cannibal Corp CDs. And then it was just like, oh my God, what's this? What's this? What's this? And then, you know, we got on 
the bleeding and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, all right, this is it. No more Google dolls for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's funny, man. So then when, uh, when did you start college then roughly what years was that? 97, 97. 97. I graduated in, uh, May of 97. And then within one and a half weeks, I was in Seattle starting art school. So you, so you weren't in Seattle in like the peak grunge years of like 91, no. like 94 or so then. Depending on who you talk to, I was actually there at the very tail end of, of cool Seattle. <laughs> okay, got it. Oh, man. So then what about like uh, art and like anything visual related? Like, did you go to school for that or was it something else? So um, school was kind of weird because when I was a teenager, I was all about comic books. That's what okay. I wanted to be. I wanted to be a comic book artist. And my dad actually drove me out to New Jersey to do an interview with the uh, Joe Kubert school, oh, which yeah. is like pretty, oh, you, know, yeah. Yeah, you know it. So, yeah. And, and so I, I went, I did the, the audience the might not know about the Joe Kubert school though. So yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, I know a little bit about it, but everyone has a different take. You know what I mean? Okay, cool. Well, what, 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 you know, like I said, I was super into comics and, and when I, I would read a magazine wizard, the guide to comics, which oh, yeah. they would constantly, uh, I mean, they would promote everything, you know? I mean, obviously there was ads that the uh, Joe Kuber school was paying for, but I mean, they would just be like, I mean, and, and, and all you artists out there, if you really want to get a leg up, you want to go to the Joe Kuber school. It's basically an advertising leg of, of it in a way. I was like, I have to go there. It's the only way I'm going to be able to be a good artist. <laughs> and uh, so my dad, you know, he drove me out there, you know, we had no, by the way, we didn't have a, a ton of money uh, back then. And I'm, I know my parents didn't have anything saved up for me. Uh, and so we drove out there and, uh, you know, it was kind of expensive at the time. Probably still is. I mean, all schools are really, but like, uh, it was, it was a good interview. I didn't feel like they asked a lot of questions. I thought, I, I thought that it was going to be a little more, uh, I don't know, rigorous, like but it was more collective. like, put, yeah, I put all my stuff out. It was like, all right, cool. You're in like, okay. But then I ended up with a weird, weird case of culture shock. And, uh, I was from Kansas and I'm, uh, you know, Midwestern boy. I'm used to lots of space between houses, yards, front yards, uh, not a lot of cable car wires going overhead. I don't know. I, everything just felt very like, like Dover, New Jersey just felt very like enclosed to me and it felt very claustrophobic. And I, I, I don't know. I just couldn't do it. I, I told, I told my dad, I was like, man, I'm really sorry. You drove me all the way out here. I just, I feel like, I feel like this is not my place. And uh, so you realize like, that before going to the school, like attending, you, this is during the interview yes, process. Yes, You're I like staying overnight there. in a hotel or something. Yeah, we. It? Yeah, it was just the interview, just going up to their school, uh, talking with the guy, the administrator guy, doing the interview thing. Uh, it was it was really it was really quick after that. I, I remember just feeling, like, man, I don't I don't think I want to move to New Jersey, Dad. <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't place it. I think it was just a. Now, as an adult, I look at all of New England in general and just kind of like, oh, that's that's a cool vibe. And I, and, I, and I think I would like it now. But when you're growing up in a town of 8000 people in Kansas with nothing but wheat fields, it's just kind of it was just a big, big change for yeah. me. Um, so the, the Joe Kieber thing wasn't meant to be. That was one of those crossroads in life where I could have went that way and chose to go the other way. And I, uh, my, I had, I had aunts that lived in Seattle. And so I just, at that point I was like, I, I need, I think that was also kind of part of it is I have no family in New Jersey. So I was terrified of being alone and having to do all of that myself, make just contacts, friends, jobs, whatever, all by myself. And there was, there was a certain sense of comfort of having just two aunts that lived in Seattle. Plus actually my grandparents at the time did uh, live in Se near Seattle. They lived in Arlington which is North. And, uh, and so it was just, okay, I, I got, I got to go somewhere where there's family. And that's when I just basically started looking up art schools in Seattle, the art schools, there was really only two at the time. And there was Cornish, which is still around, I think I'm pretty sure there. And they are, they were more of the fine art side of things. They were more of like, if you want to be doing the gallery thing and stuff like that. Uh, I looked at the school, they seemed a little hoity toity for me at the time. Yeah. Uh, and then there was the Art, Art Institute of Seattle, which I ended up going to. Now everyone kind of knows that they're they were like one of the most ruthlessly for-profit art schools in the country, and they all went out of 
business because of it. You know, their administration was incredibly shady. You know, they would try to say stuff like, uh, we have employment placement after you graduate. So everyone would get this idea that they're just going to graduate and then the school was going to find them a job, which is like, what? And that's just not how the art world works. <laughs> you know, it's, it's portfolio based. And, and so, uh, yeah, it was, it was weird. So it was only, only two years of that, but it was not for drawing. And this is the interesting thing is that, uh, when, when I decided that Joe Kubert wasn't my path, it also included another realization that I was worried that just being only a comic book artist, and there's, I have tons of professional comic book artists, friends, and this isn't to, you know, speak ill of that entire industry. I'm just saying for me at the time, I was concerned that if I just started only doing like penciling, for example, that I would be limiting my, my, myself for job opportunities in the future. Yeah. And so what I did was I said, all right, I'm going to try to find something a little more well-rounded and, and I'm looking around me. I'm, I'm going, what am I doing? And I open up a Fangoria big horror fan. And so I had already had a stack of Fangoria magazines. And in the back of those, they had a lot of Tom Savini, like, you know, sculpting on his clay, uh, for, you know, creep show they, you know, there's lots of photos that everyone's seen online for a million years where he's, sculpting on fluffy from creep show and i was like what's that that's a job i could do that job i want to do that job and uh so I, you know you know when you know how it is when you're 17 18 you're just like what do i want to do where am i gonna go what am i gonna do and so i, I said all right well, let's try that because I, I i can draw but i can't sculpt and so let's try to let's try to go to school for that let's see if i can try to sculpt so I called the Art Institute of Seattle. And of course, I, I got a little bit of the line from their administrator too. I was like, so I want, this is what I want to do. I, I want to do like uh, creature effects for uh, movies. Yeah. Like, okay. Well, what you want is our industrial design technology program. There, there's lots of sculpting and model making and stuff that movie makers can absolutely utilize. Like, oh, cool. And, uh, you know, an industrial designer is, is not, is not a, <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's a bit yeah. different. A little yeah, a little different. But obviously, right? there's, there's shared skills there, you yeah. know. And obviously, there there are plenty of industrial designers needed in, you know, uh, film and people that uh, are doing, uh, you know, creature effects or whatever. Like they, I figured, yeah, they probably have backgrounds in IDT. So, so I, so that, that's what I ended up doing. And uh, so, two years of that, learning how to sculpt, learning how to model make, learning um, how to mold things, all that kind of stuff. And I didn't go anywhere because going to California to get a job in that industry is nigh fucking impossible. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's funny how that works. Cause I mean, I, I appreciate the, the, the stuff I learned in that school, even if it, even if they did have kind of a weird, uh, you know, a weird administration, whatever you call them, predatory administration. I, I still felt that the, the professors that I had were, were good. And I, and I still feel that I, I did get a, a good education there despite all that. So That's good. So then when you graduated, what did you end up doing for work for like the short term and stuff? Yeah. So the, that was where I realized that the, the movie thing was going to happen. My, my mom uh, and her husband were living in LA. And so I said, all right, I'm going to move down to LA for a couple of years. Well, I, at the time it wasn't a couple of years at the time it was, I'm moving to LA for good. And, uh, and I went down there and, and I tried, you know, I mean, I gave it my best effort, you know, um, it, I, obviously every, every person's, uh, you know, experience is going to be different. Um, I was good. I thought I was good at, at the time. Well, objectively, if I go back and look at my work that I was showing some of these creature shops at the time, it was, it was certainly amateurish. I mean, there's, there's, there's no question there. There was, I wasn't ready at, at 18 to, to do that. There, there are other 18 year olds that were ready to do that <laughs> at the time. And, but I had, uh, I had, uh, school loans that had to start getting paid off. So yeah. I was panicking. I was like, well, what the hell am I going to do? I'm going to have all this money I have to pay. It's like, they get like a six month grace period to start paying off loans. Yeah. And I guess I got lucky because my, uh, mom's husband uh, is, was a programmer in, uh, at a, at, at the time <laughs> they're, they're a lot more known now, but at the time, a kind of a smaller uh, game developer called Treyarch. And, um, now, now they're famous for, you know, call of duty and stuff like that. But back then they were mostly making uh, baseball games huh. and, uh, some little fantasy games, a lot of 
uh, random IPs like Max Steel was like a Mattel toy. They, they, they did like a Max this Steel. This is like game. early 2000s at this point. Yeah, 2000. Yeah, yeah. 2000. I March of 2000 was when I, when I got my job. He basically said, "I can't get you the job, but I can put your portfolio on top of the stack." And I was like, "But I don't have any." You know, I had like a little bit of Photoshop. I I taken a, a class for Photoshop at school. I was like, I don't have any. And it's like, well, you know, I mean, 2000 was a different time period for video games. Now they got DigiPen. You're, you know, kids coming out of, out of that are expected to have this huge toolkit of stuff that even I don't know as a 24 year vet in the industry. Like, even I don't know some of the stuff that these kids are coming out of school with. But at that time, I mean, they, they you know, it was kind of a, yeah, it was kind of a who you know thing anyway, right? And so, so, uh, I guess that, that 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 was my big luck moment was that you know my mom's husband just happened to already work in games, and so I was able to get that portfolio. And they were like, "Well, this is all traditional, but I mean, we can teach you." They don't do that anymore. <laughs> they, yeah. they, they don't teach people how to use three D software anymore. So I got I basically had my second leg of schooling at the first year of working at Treyarch because they taught me how to three D model. They taught me how to unwrap uvs which means put the texture on um you know all that kind of stuff uh, and so that was uh, the, the first two years were the art institute and the second two years were treyarch <laughs> that, was, that was my schooling interesting and then ever since then you've just been working in the video game industry the same type of role and just getting better at it like in terms of like the modeling and sculpting of stuff. yeah right I've done a few different things. Uh, I started off as just basically, basically a, a texture artist because it took a little while to learn how to model and stuff like that. Um, and, and and then I moved up into what's called environment art. I moved back to Seattle and worked at uh, Monolith Productions. I worked on Fear and Fear 2. And that in, involved more level design, not level design, but level art, um, doing blood effects on the wall, spatter, stuff like that making a lot of cubicles in, a, in an office building <laughs> level that we had to do. Um, while in and, a cubicle? Uh, huh? Said while yeah, in, in a cubicle? In a cubicle, making a cubicle. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a different level of purgatory, man. If you want to work on something cool, like something that you can go to your buddies and be like, look, man, look what I worked on. Like you're, you're looking at minimum 60 hour weeks, uh, possibly upwards of 80. If, if their man, their middle management are extra, terrible at managing um time and schedules and stuff like that and i do i always blame the middle management it's it's never the the, wor the workers are not lazy the the workers are not you know uninterested in creating art they have a passion for art they want to keep making art they, they 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 want to you know make the best possible looking games they can make every single one of them to be honest and then yeah. they just get broken <laughs> they just get broken because this is too much i feel you um has it been challenging or what's it been like having to continuously learn with the level of expectation and advancement in the video game industry? So video games in 2000 obviously look a lot more old and archaic than what's yeah. what's out there now. So like, what's it like from your perspective? Is it just like always continuous learning? Is it new people coming in and teaching? Like, I've always wondered about that. Like, how does industries like film and, and video games, how do they all collectively get so much more advanced at kind of yeah. somewhat of a similar play pace. I mean, obviously there's your innovators, but I think you get the gist of the question, but it's, yeah. I've always kind of like, it's baffled me. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think where it probably comes from mostly is the number one, your, your, your core like engine and tools programmers, they're, they're pushing everything forward. And, and so they're, they're the ones that are the kind of masterminds behind, getting the the ability to have better graphics when you're first making the game all the artists want to have all the biggest textures because that's what looks the best but the fact is home computers can't process those giant textures all the time that's what we have to go through it's called an optimization uh pass through the game where all of our textures go and and they start looking like pretty crappy at least at least back when i was working on triple a games i don't work on triple yeah. a games anymore but back then it was like you'd be um trying to make them pretty and then someone would come and be like hey you, you, you need to spend a couple of days uh just batch going through and reducing everything you'd be like uh oh. and so 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 then so then you find out they're developing this new stuff that oh and now, now it's all 
we can we can have these big textures and you're like oh awesome and so 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 then there's that that part of it right so the, the you already already got the artists who are trying to make it look as good as possible and they typically get kind of pulled back okay that makes sense it, right it, but but then you also have the fact that many places i've been lucky I'm, i've been working at my current uh, em, uh employer for 15 years uh which is rare um but most people i think are are, are there, there's always the chance of the guillotine you know, I mean, I mean, the layoffs happen all the time. This year in, in the gaming industry was was particularly brutal. Lots and lots and lots of friends have been laid off. Lots and lots of friends still haven't found work, and it's it's bad. It's really really bad. And so when you're working with a situation like that, I think that people are always it's survival. They're like, I, I could get laid off at any moment. So am I going to be the artist out there that's like, hey, check out what I can do. I can do A, B, and C. And then, yeah, 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 but a hundred other people over here just applied. They can do A, B, C, and X, Y, Z. Can you do X, Y, Z? Like, oh, oh, I can't do X, Y, Z. Like, well, then you're fucked, you know. And so, so you have to really keep up on the new technology on the off chance that you're looking for work, really. So, yeah, and and that's why it's such a burnout industry because it's just it never ends. Like you basically yes. wake and end your day thinking yeah. about these things. Yeah. yeah, so that's why I got out of AAA games because AAA games, and when I say AAA, I mean basically the ones that are on everyone's lips, right? The Fortnites of the world, the you know all that kind of stuff. Everyone talks about them. You know, I mean, I've never worked there, so I couldn't tell you specifically how what it's like to work at that specific developer. But just if I'm talking trends in the industry, right? The the, the higher demand for something, the, the the more pressure. The more pressure, they need more people. They need more people. Well, once they get through with that milestone or their game or whatever, they've bloated them, and they, and 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 the, the the company has no no other choice but to reduce, and so they end up having to, you know, uh, let Are people go. Are there a lot but, of contractors uh, in the industry, like a lot of ten ninety nine people for yes. like big projects yes. and stuff? In fact, that I don't know how it is now, um, but I remember a few years ago I had a few bu- buddies that were working at Bungie. And they were saying that they worked at Bungie and they were on contract. I'm like, oh, but have you worked there for like, like six years, dude? Like, yeah, it's, it's still contract. Like, excuse me? Like, how do you get insurance? Like, oh, you got to buy it yourself. And I'm just like, oh my God. Like, I would never in a million years want to do that. It's so scary. I mean, obviously, you know, you talk to a lot of artists. A lot, a lot of these people uh, are hard, like full-blown, like full-time freelance. And they already have to do that kind of stuff anyway. Be their own boss and get their own insurance. Yada, yada, yada. But Right. You know, when you're, I feel that if you're, if you're working for a company that is paying some people benefits, <laughs> they, they're, they're just trying to get out of it. <laughs> you know, they're just, they're just trying to, if you're stringing along for six years and they haven't hired you on as a full-time salaried role with benefits, I feel like they're just taking advantage of you at that point. <laughs> but you don't have a lot of bargaining power like you're talking about because it, people will just, yeah, it's, it's tough, man. I think there's a lot of overlap in the really in any type of like quote unquote fun industry like film, music, art, things that are like dedicated to passions of sorts. You're just more and more at risk of being exploited for that reason. You know I what agree. I mean? Like, I that's absolutely what's agree. So tough about it. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of jobs out there. I mean, I don't know. Do, does anyone say they really want to be? like for the funsies, like a wall street broker. I mean, they get into that cause it makes a ton of money, you know? Right. So it's like, I'm, I'm obviously they, I, those people are working hard too. I'm not saying they're not, but it's just like, I feel like the jobs that kind of suck are the ones that pay the most. And then the ones that are like, awesome, like, Ooh, Ooh, hell yeah. I'm a freaking artist, man. Like they're the ones that it's like, I don't know. It's just kind of, it's a passion and they know they can get you. To, exactly. to work those extra hours or to, cause you have the privilege of working in such a cool job. Like, I mean, it's, it's still hard. <laughs> it's, it's still a lot of hours, a lot of hours. And, and, and my brain is, 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 I'm never on autopilot. I mean, I don't know, but there's some master artists out there that can just like, you know, I'm, I'm still checking every little angle, every little, if it, you know, whatever perspective or, highlight every all the lighting is there's a lot to think about right and and it, i'm just like 
my brain's never resting. <laughs> this is uh, this is supposed to be fun. I mean, it is fun, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, I I get you. There's I I whenever I find that I'm like, hmm, art's feeling easy right now. I'm usually about to get humbled the next day by like making that. some stupid mistake or just yeah. overlooking something or getting overconfident. I mean. I think that's part of the artist's journey outside of, you know, what you're talking with work, just like even with your own personal stuff. Um, any professional artists I've talked with or people who have done it their whole lives, they're usually the most humble people ever because they've had their ass handed to them over and over again. I know. Like, I don't even know how. I mean, I, I think if you were if you were like, you know, from like Frazetta's era, I kind of feel like you have the right to be kind of an asshole. Like I've heard Frazetta was a big asshole. It's like. I mean, but look what he did. Look, look, look what yeah. he accomplished and like how good he was. And like, he was able to get his way to that position in that time period with, there was no internet. There was no, I mean, how, how do you even get contacts to, to, to do like fantasy illustration covers? Like as a teenager with what trajectory will get you there. And so like, I, I give all those old, old legends, like total passes. If, if I ever hear their assholes, I'm like, I don't give a shit. Like, like, like now though, I feel like everyone kind of has to kind of like, you know, we're all helping each other in a way. I mean, you're helping me today. Uh, you know, I hope I'm helping you. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, always you know, helpful for yeah. me, man. Yeah, I, 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 it's... Everyone's, everyone's helping each other. I always yeah. try to help everyone. If someone writes me a message, oh man, how'd you do this? I mean, I always write back because I remember what it was like. It, it was freaking hard. Like every step of the way has been hard. <laughs> and so, yeah, I just always try to help. So like you're working fairly crazy hours or at least it's it's a demanding job for your day job yeah how are you fitting in all this freelance work for bands which is probably the primary reason people are aware of your work in the metal sphere and the reason i reached out to begin with um but like yeah. how do you juggle all that how do you keep uh your head on straight well uh peaks and valleys <laughs> yeah uh ba basically so sometimes i'm pushing it Last year, I, I really pushed it, and and, and that's why um, you know I've got album covers that are getting released finally. You know, like where people are like, "Oh, hey, you did that Oceano thing. Oh, hey, you did that Unleash the Archer thing." I did those a year ago, um, and and so now they're just finally coming out. Like I haven't done, I've only done one thing this year, and it wasn't even for an album cover, and that's just because I've been, I, ha I have in fact been burned out, and yeah. and, and I have needed breaks. I, I played Baldur's Gate three. Is what I did. I played video games <laughs> <laughs> and I played D and D with my buddies. And well, not we're not, we're actually playing the 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 rule book of D and D at the moment. But we we have done that, and then now we're playing a couple other tabletop games. But I, I just I just fill up my my time with uh, other stuff to keep my head clear. And then if an opportunity comes up, I take it. So I'm not nearly as prolific uh, as I used to be. I used to be writing bands all the time. Like say, hey, you know, I would look at like when like the release was like if, if they had just released an album like six months to a year ago, I wouldn't even bother writing them. But, but if they had been like three, two or three years, then I'd be like, all right, I got to write this band. Cause they might need something soon. You know, yeah. <laughs> I, I just cold call the hell out of people. I, I remembered, uh, um, Todd McFarlane, uh, oh, back yeah. in the day. The hero of mine. Oh yeah. yeah. I know the story. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's you would, the yeah, best. You'd write a hundred people and get, yeah. Two replies and one would turn into a job, right? Or something like that. And that's that's what I did. You know, I took that advice and it did work, but I don't have the energy for it anymore. Like uh, I don't have the energy to deal with all the different uh all the different personalities and the d different types of you know poor communication that people use these days, you know. I I'm out here trying to be professional, like, oh hello, I am a fan of blah blah and they're like back like you know, like, oh sorry, bro. <laughs> <I'm Yeah. looking laughs> right now, bro. <laughs> just like whatever <laughs> so I, I don't have the energy for it anymore i just kind of right. wait i just release i just i just i just work for the bands that, that already hire me and then if and then usually what ends up happening is that band will have fans of them and 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 then those band the, 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 they also have bands and then they will try to get me to do album covers for them and then i'll keep busy that way but it makes it easy on me because then because i because because I am kind of burned out right now. If, if it's not like a particularly attractive project, I just be like, oh, I, I can't right now, man. I'm sorry. Maybe in a couple months. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a luxury because I do have a nine to five. Like if I didn't have a nine to five, I would have a different attitude for sure. I'd be like, you know, a lot more fierce with, with, with trying to get uh, work. But um, right now at, at where I'm at in life, I, I just kind of take every day as a, as a, as a new thing. And, and if, 
if bands are writing me wanting to do art, I'm, I'm open. But if they're not, I got other, per- I mean, I'm an artist like through and through, like I, 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 I got my own projects going on. I got a 3d printer that I, I'm looking forward to digging into and making some cool, weird toys. Nice. Stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. And I think that's good advice for any artists out there too. Um, you know, who are maybe just not as experienced at this point, but like always be making personal work that's fulfilling for yourself. Like always. Yeah. Because once you stop doing that, you can kind of lose sight of what your vision really is. And then when you have your vision, you can input that and meld it with whatever the band's vision is. And then yes. that's when the ideal, you know, product comes out. So I, yeah. I think it's very and- important to like always be you can think about marketability, but you gotta always think about what's personally fulfilling for you. Yeah. And that ultimately does determine when I hit the burnout. If I find that I've done too many things in a row where, where a band had like a very specific idea and I had to interpret their very specific idea. Basically, I don't feel like I'm, I'm creating something at that point. I am interpreting what they want, which is part of the job. And I'm cool with that. But if it's too many of those in a row, um, I may either decline or I may, try to t- take more of the ones we're like do what you want although the do what you want ones definitely sometimes tr- kind of bite you in the ass, ass a little bit too yeah yeah you know about that yeah it's, but it, it, it's oh god i still have one that i made i'm not even exaggerating six years ago and he dude still hasn't released anything with it and i'm just so bummed because it was a really really cool illustration but he, he was one of those do whatever you want and it was the biggest nightmare oh my gosh biggest nightmare he had he had so many he he, he would he would send me a screenshot of, of, of the, of the artwork that I did. Yeah. And he would, he would marquee out a section, like whatever brush you used here, can you use it over here too? And I'm just sitting there going like, I'm in hell. I'm in actual hell right now. Be, 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 because like, I don't even feel like I, now I feel like I'm a ventriloquist dummy and he's got his hand <laughs> on my ass. You know, I, 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 do you want me to do the art or not? Like, or do you, are you the artist? Like, no, you're not the artist. <laughs> And, and, you know, and, and I pushed back a little bit on him and he was like, you know, I, I paid you. And, and he, and he was actually one, one of the, this never happens by the way. Yeah. Usually I get the deposit. Then before I send the high resolution, they get their, their file. Right. He paid everything all at once. I was like, Oh, well, shit. Cool. Thanks man. Oh, never again. Because he, once he had paid everything, I, I feel that he felt that I was like a slave. Like yeah. I, I, everything yeah, I had to leverage. do. Yeah, because because you know it's easier for me to. I have like a no refund policy on deposits, but I don't really do that with uh, a full amount. I think I'd feel bad if I took a full amount from someone and they weren't happy. Like I want them to be happy, but there's a limit. You know, <laughs> it's like there's only so much I can do. And I was about to pull the plug several times and just send him the whole damn amount back. I was so close to doing that. Finally, was able to get it through the, you know, the final stages or whatever, but. Yeah, but still even looking in limbo at it now, somewhere. <laughs> so the process was like hell, but you do like the end result. Yeah, the end result's awesome. I, I, I that's why I'm, that's why I'm kind of mad because like, oh, is, I've shown it privately to friends or whatever, but like, it's it's just a cool painting, man. It's just it's a very, uh, I don't know, maybe now people would accuse it of being AI because it look it, it looks kind of like, uh, it, I definitely like, uh, you know, Bixinski. And so yeah. it kind of had that kind of vibe. And so now, maybe now, people would look at it and be like, that's AI. I'm like, oh. Well, I mean, they did that to anything, anything I make anyway, but <sighs> <sighs> the times we live in, right? <laughs> so what's the worst, like, someone accusing you of AI, like, instance so far? And when did it start for you? Oh, I mean, it's almost as soon as, soon as it became wi- widespread, like, beyond like the mid- mid-journey beta or whatever. Yeah, yeah, 2022, somewhere around there. But the most recent one that was just like what was it was the oceano one that i did because uh you know i use 3d and it definitely has that like rendered shiny quality to it which i think is is a tip off to some people who don't know what the fuck they're looking at but it's too intentional everything's too intentional for that but but the that that's the hardest part of all this is is there's these people that are fighting against ai online and you'd think they'd be our allies like they think i think they think they're our allies but they're not because all they want to do is cause strikes. They just want to go on the comment threads and cause shit. And so yeah. the first thing that happens is Oceana posts it. And I'm like, cool, man. I've been waiting for like a year for this. Hope people like it. I still read the comments. I'm an idiot. And so I, I, I looked at the comments. People were liking it. Oh, this is awesome. And then, of course, th- th- then they start. Like, I'm like, 
Just don't reply. I was, obviously, don't reply. It's stupid. Oceanos, they're good. They're good people, and, and and they started replying. They started being like, dude, like no, like not even no. Dusty's been our artist since like 2010. So I mean, that's like a whole decade before AI even existed. So you're not gonna, you're not gonna make those accusations. Then they try to they, these people try to like uh, make up some bullshit about oh well the drummer said it was AI. I I'm saw like, that comment. I know what you're talking about. Okay, I, well, I look, I, it's like where did they say that? Like, let me just text band member you know what i'm saying like, I, I, it isn't like i can't I, I i'm in communication with these people they aren't like lady gaga tier <laughs> of freaking uh you know celebrity status they're, they're just a band that i work for who has amassed a, a good fan following but they're very humble people they're very good people and so i i wrote them and i was like dude what's up with this he's like that's bullshit dude no no <laughs> no like that's what i thought but see someone says something and magically 20 other people are, well, I read, like, yeah, you read the, the, the idiot liar over there, right? <laughs> and then you took it as that. Way too much of that. I mean, our parents told us, don't believe everything you see online. And somehow that advice seems to have just get, gotten completely tossed down the toilet because everyone believes the, the first headline they see and they don't even bother to look past it or whatever. You know what I mean? So the world yeah. we live in, it, it's, it's awful. I, I, I hate it. I, 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 I did the thing though. I, I, I posted my little um i guess it is it is a good thing in, th in this case that i i do use a lot of 3d models uh to start uh my pieces and so i can just e very easily do a spin around uh, of, of the model and be like look that's that's proof there's your proof right there like i i, I, mo I modeled this by hand i painted it painted it over it uh you know to give it the the 2d kind of semi painterly look and zero ai in the entire process you know, it's e it's easy to, to, to you know to disprove, uh, but it still sucks that we have to like fly swat these things away now. Yeah, I hate no, that. I, I, it's it's good hearing that perspective and uh, experience, you know, because I think other artists are seeing it too, and ultimately, most artists want the same thing, which is credit for their work and then value to their work, and AI yeah. not taking away that value. But yeah, uh, I think people who are just careless on any spectrum uh, when it comes to this are are making it more difficult than it needs to be. You know? Yeah, yeah, I know. I, yeah, I, I appreciate anyone that wants to stand up for artists. Please stand up for art. Please yeah. like call out things you you know are AI. But like, if it's like a label doing it, like. I think you can be because they're just like the label, right? Like if you the label posts the, the the artwork and hey, that's AI. Like it's okay. I think it's okay to be a little more like in, insistent with it because they may not even listen. But if you're if you're literally like talking to the artist, like the artist is like in the thread talking, like hey man, just talk to me. Like talk to me. I'm here. I'm not a faceless weirdo. Like I'm actually like just chatting with you, and I'm telling you, <laughs> and I'm showing you proof, <laughs> right? That, yeah like you're, you're no longer my ally if you're still arguing with me <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah well i want to circle back to one thing so you're talking about there was a period where you're doing a lot of cold calling for working with bands so i guess if you had the 95 and you've pretty much always had that since you know leaving school then what compelled you to even start trying to work with bands like was ah. that always kind of a dream it was I for me when you when you're working at a game developer it is it is a team effort. I mean, one hundred percent team effort. The, the, there is no personal accolades at all. M maybe if you're one of the character designers who who designs a big cool monster that everyone loves or something, you know, then yeah, obviously, uh, you know, people are gonna go, well, who who who's the guy that did that concept art? I'm not a concept artist really though, so I mean, guy who made the cubicles in fear. <laughs> not not gonna get i don't know i just i i, I don't want to be famous i don't want to be uh like you know rich and famous uh whatever cribs lifestyle <laughs> ridiculous so you I, don't want to be but, todd mcfarland then yeah yeah really literally <laughs> um i just i just i just want people to to to, to vibe with me I, I want the people that like the kind of shit i like to and i want to share that with them like that, that's that's to me what what my entire uh artistic journey has been is like it started with comic books in, in junior high and I, and, I, and I sought out other people who, who collected comics because I'm like, man, let's talk about these cool comics together. 
right? And then I got super hardcore into horror movies, which I'm still into both of these things, by the way. And then I'm like, well, I need to find more friends that are into horror movies because it sucks not being able to, you know, talk about this. And again, like all this, those early days things, it was before the internet really took off. So it's really important to have that tribe, right? And and um, and so, but then then I, I just I always wanted to create, always wanted to draw, always wanted to paint, always wanted to sculpt, always wanted to do everything. Like nothing was ever enough. Like I, I just want to keep learning. And um, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I lost a little bit of a train of thought there on on what the question was, but uh, just yeah, ultimately, I, like your desire to work with bands, you know? Oh yeah, okay, gotcha. Thank you. Uh, and so basically, uh, around '06, that's when the blood bath thing happened. I was thinking, like, I need to find an avenue that's me. I need to find something that lets me get out there so I can I can meet more more people like me, more artists that are into horror, more artists that are into heavy metal. And I figured, uh, you know, if, ultimately, if, if, I, if I'm doing this kind of stuff with bands, naturally, I'm just going to f- meet more of these people. So, and it did work out. That is exactly what has happened. <laughs> you so you, how did you do cold outreach then for getting the bloodbath gig? Or how did that come <laughs> about? All right, so, 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 so this is one that requires a little bit of a disclaimer because I have to tell the story and then I have to. Then I then I need to explain why I, I don't want people to do this. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, it was uh, it was a it was a spec art contest. Yeah, they 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 did the hey everybody, send us your cool uh, you know artwork, and then we'll choose someone, and uh, we'll we'll give you the pitch. You know, we'll, we'll give you the uh, what we want, and then you know you do it, and then we choose the best one, and the winner gets to be the album cover. I was a lot younger then, and I was really different like I said, era was, too. Different era, yeah. Uh, didn't really even know what the term spec art was back then. Didn't understand the idea that it, you know, devalued all the people who were, you know, paying or you know, charging money for their art and that kind of thing. Just didn't understand. I'd only I'd worked professionally, but only in video games. So my first, uh, you know, toe in the water on on getting into this was just lack of experience. Um, but I did that. I, I, I wrote, uh, them. I said, Hey, here's my art. I'm like, wow, this is cool. Like, uh, you know, and then, and then, uh, Anders Nystrom, uh, he wrote back and he said, you know, we want this thing with a dog priest. I mean, actually got it right here at the, nice. the dog priest, uh, with the b- b- bathing, uh, you know, doing the baptism of the baby in blood with disciples in the background. I'm like, all right, I can do that. And, uh, I just, I just really wanted to do at the time, like, I wanted to prove that I'm not just video game artists making textures. Like I, I wanted to be someone who, who drew or painted, told a story with an image. And, and that was, that was it, that, 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 you know, the rest is history and they ended up choosing it or whatever. And then they actually did hire me like properly, you know, for the, the next one after that, for the, for the Fathomless Mastery. So they, 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 they made the Fathomless Mastery. Yep. Oh, I love that cover. I didn't oh, know that. Good. I love to hear that. Um, a lot of people didn't get it. <laughs> oh no, dude, I love that cover. And I, dude, that album, that's my favorite bloodbath album. Okay, cool. So, like, awesome. like that uh, has a very deep memory for me. Um, because I was a huge Opeth fan. <laughs> oh yeah, dude. I love that cover. I actually like drew shit when I was in early uh, mid high school that um, it wasn't it was inspired by that cover really? like the like contorted <laughs> limbed creatures and they kind of have yeah, like yeah. long arms and shit. Yeah, I made like these um, kind of werewolf like monsters that I just loved how like the body was contorted. I mean, you uh. can even see like I do like these contortionists now and like. It probably does root back from that, dude. I I love I that. Love that cover. Oh, I no it makes me feel so good right now because that makes me really happy, dude. Because when it came out, I was a little bit, um, I was unsure of. Uh, I, I I thought I got in, in over my head a little bit on uh, two things. One, I was uh, uh, they said they wanted the whole prop. The whole prompt for the cover was just um, like emaciated uh, humans writhing in agony like like a hell on earth they're each going th- through their own hell on earth i'm like yeah all right cool so dick but i was like uh, i was unsure at the time if um 
my anatomy was particularly good. I was trying to go for kind of a Bosch kind of thing anyway. And so that might've been a little, I was worried I was biting off a little more than I could chew on that one. I thought I had the faces down pretty good, but then I was like, Oh shit, should I have given them more clothing, you know, like more like little sashes or something? Cause they're, they're all basically naked with the exception of a little, little, uh, loincloth. Kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And, but, but Not I just well started getting overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah, I just started getting overwhelmed, and the and the deadline was hitting. I'm like, I have to turn this over, man. Like, I, I hope th they loved it. They loved it, and uh, and so it was all good. But then, you know, that was the. I think there was a, a few people that died. They, 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 I'm sure you've seen the the twister meme. There was a meme out there where they, they had. I've never seen twister. that. Oh, it's it kind it of funny, funny though. That's no, kind of funny. I loved it. I lo I loved the joke. Uh, it, but it, but I, but it also came to a realization that like. Okay. 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 This is a. This has some elements to it which are a little silly. But that's. I don't know. That's okay. I. I. Back then, when I was like twenty eight or something like that, I was like, no, this is supposed to be serious. Like grim, frostbitten, er, er, right. Yeah. But now that I've gotten older and I'm chilled out a lot more, I'm like, no, man. Like I, I love it that metal can be like super serious, even like immortal or something. It's like, yeah, ooh, evil. But there's like a, a level of, uh, fun to it totally. for lack of a better word that i like and i like that uh most people get it <laughs> some people don't some people seem to be uh oh yeah it's always serious yeah it's serious, yeah i like it's amazing I like how guys. some people don't ever kind of grow out of that it's very yeah. odd to me yeah yeah uh, i mean yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah we could go on a whole thing there like the, the people who watch this usually are very open-minded and artists themselves um Damn, dude. I did not know you did that. I literally just listened to that the other day. Like, that's one oh, of my cool. favorite death metal albums. And the I never had the CD until like 2016, 17, when I was like more actively collecting. But the uh, fucking yeah. iTunes image of that painting. Wow. That's cool, dude. I'm Thank glad you. it that, that means, means a lot to you because it, me it means something yeah. to me as well. Uh, Thank you. All right. So that's how you got with Bloodbath then. So, oh, you, your question is about the cold calling. The cold yeah, calling. When did, when did that first work for you? That I actually first worked with uh, Six Feet Under. Uh, okay. I, 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 at that point, like I, I was really into uh, Haunted and Maximum Violence. Mm -hmm. I still think those two albums are, are fantastic albums. I, they, mm -hmm. they were, his his voice was 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 popping at that point. It was late nineties, early early aughts and so it was i mean he was still making the kind of music that i was like yeah dude and so i wrote him and uh, i don't know dude it, it was like uh, social media was definitely a thing for sure i mean there was there, there was facebook by that point but uh a lot of people a lot of people had websites and you could just click like contact and and surprisingly enough it went straight to chris barnes you know like it, it wasn't like to, to the metal blade or whatever it was straight to chris barnes he just wrote back and he, he was just like hey man like uh you know, I, if I if I remember correctly, it was something like, uh, "Hey man, like a lot of people send me stuff. Like uh, this is this is a step up. Uh, you want to do a shirt?" And I was like, "Sure, let's do it." And uh, he just said he wanted a, a like a skeleton. He's big. He's big about skulls and skeletons, by the way. If you didn't know, uh, <laughs> cool. All right. Yeah. And uh, so skulls and skeletons. And he said, "Was like a skeleton uh, with like was angel it this one?" Uh, no, actually, it would be it would, it would end up being the graveyard classics four album cover he liked it so much that he oh really put it on that album cover yeah oh, that's cool yeah that one that that one you just showed came a little bit later after we had solidified the working relationship a little bit more you i believe that was also with the Chris. last one that i did for him so <laughs> and you were always like directly working with chris the entire time yeah always yeah he, he, he was he was really like let you do your own thing as long as it was like you know something he would put it something marketable he 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 had the opinion that uh things with skulls uh sold yeah like really well so he's like just just keep it keep it scully and you're good and I'm like all right cool so that's what i did and uh later on we i tried to start basing things off of like his lyrics or whatever um uh, but in general my i did quite a few shirts early on for him that were just 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 straight up skulls to the point where yeah you know, i almost felt like bad just like really you just want like some skull okay cool i mean there wasn't any composition or anything it was just like me just <laughs> go and uh then later on uh, after i i did the un undead and unborn the sister albums uh then yeah, i love those covers cool yeah cool. i really love I those like covers let me pull them up here 
Okay, cool. I, I like them too. Um, I think a lot of people didn't get it that they were supposed to be sister albums, maybe because uh, I, I occasionally would get a few comments like they're like the same cover, like they're kind of supposed to be, but anyway, you know, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're different. Um, I like them a lot, and he basically let me do whatever I wanted on that one. Uh, there was another one I'd done that was also for what would be end up uh, end up being undead that I did, and uh, this is the downside is when you work with uh chris on some of this stuff uh there's, there's a high chance that you know you might go through a full painting and then just just doesn't get used like nah, i'm not feeling that one dude like okay cool uh we'll use that for something else i guess <laughs> you know and that now uh i kind of put protections in place yeah. with my contract where that doesn't happen anymore but at the time i was kind of like uh, well whatever you know <laughs> i'll do it because i do want to work on this album cover it was, you know Rookie mistakes, but it worked out. There's your protections now. Is it basically just certain levels of edits? And I guess, yeah. what is it? Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, what, uh, there's enough, there's a point where I'll show like a sketch or something and be like, okay, th this is kind of the point, right? Like, this is the point where you go, yes, I want this, or no, I don't want this. If you need right. to show your label or whatever, go show your label. I don't care. But if I finish this and you're like, eh, we don't like it, dude, th th then we're going to start having some like, you know, unhappy faces <laughs> yeah. behind my emails. <laughs> so I know it sounds like a real big threat. I mean, I always try to make everyone happy that I work with. It's just sometimes you know you, you get kind of pissed if you're wasting spinning wheels and, and just well, yeah, it's just setting expectations. I yeah. I think everything you're saying is totally fair. Um, I mean, it's it's a lot of time and love that goes into these. So there's obviously the personal disappointment of if a painting is not uh, liked by the client, like that just already personally stings. But if once the compensation gets wrapped into it, you're talking about all those hours that are wasted. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. a combination of both, but on the bright side here, like, do you have any, like, um, I mean, this is all digital then. Digital yeah, painting? these are all, all digital. At this point in time, I was occasionally, I'm I, I'm not as proficient with uh, watercolor, though I'm working on it. Um, I like it and I use it, but I what I would do at this time period is I would make these like loose, sloppy, watercolor sort of like swatches mm -hmm. to get me some cool like texture and and sort of like happy accidents or whatever you want to call them. And I think I think this was one of the first pieces where I started. This one and then the first Hoth album were the were the ones where I was experimenting with using um, watercolors and then digitally painting over the top of those. These definitely are more digitally painting than the Hoth one. The Hoth one is more, uh, more watercolor than digital paint. But yeah, that's I, I like always like painting techniques. Yeah, yeah, um, and that, I feel like that's becoming more and more of a common thing is blending traditional and digital because you get yeah. benefits of both really. Well, I'll be honest, like, I trust me, I, I 100% respect and understand why any artist would be 100% traditional in the metal industry. I love it. I wish I could do it all the time. I'm just, I, I, when I get in there with the pens or the pencil, I, I get way too, like, focused and perfectionist. Like, I've, there's more slop that I think can occur in, in digital painting. You know, I can, I can you know, reduce a layer's opacity down 50%. I mean, there's all this kind of stuff. You make a mark with a pen or, or paint, it's that's it, right? Until you fix it, if it's wrong. And uh, considering what's kind of happening with, really, with what people are paying for art these days, I, I personally can't justify spending, you know, two and a half months on a traditional acrylic painting mm -hmm. for an album cover for 800 bucks right for a thousand bucks you know I, I i it's just it's it's too much time too much of my evenings definitely colored by the fact that i have a nine to five you know um if i was just from the moment i wake up till the, whatever I, I choose to stop uh you know maybe i would i would be able to work it in a little bit more but sometimes i just got to be able to get in there with the, with the digital and just quickly make adjustments especially when like you know, bands like, oh, we really like this man, but man, sure would be cool if the sky was red instead of blue. Like, okay, cool. Well, that's a slider. No problem. Easy peasy. 
right? And so if I was just a, a wholly traditional artist, I feel like I would I would get angry at clients a lot more. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't feel that I get angry at clients as much. But uh, you know, if if I finish something, it, it's like, wow, I just the most amazing painting I feel like I've ever made. And then you turn it in, and they're like, yeah, that sky's got to be red. Like, oh, then I'm hating. Bad attitude to have, but like I, I save myself that issue by being able to use digital and uh, changing stuff a little more with a little more agility. So. Yeah, no, I, I feel you. And it's probably the biggest reason why I'm considering at some point adopting digital part of my process because yeah. I don't work with enough clients currently that right now for me, it's just, you know, art for art's sake, making it for yeah. myself. You Thank know you. what I mean? Which is great for traditional, but I think after getting bit one, two times by a client and just like, they don't get that like some changes can't be done. Yeah. Especially if you're working a watercolor. I mean, acrylic yeah. painting is more forgiving <laughs> than watercolor. Watercolor. Absolutely. Is, so it's like, man, I, I it's I hear enough of these conversations to know the risk in which I'm taking by being a traditional artist, but I also do it because I love it, you know. So it's yeah, exactly. it's always a tricky thing to balance out. Yeah, I, I feel like you, you, you're you're at a good point. You you haven't gotten jaded yet. <laughs> I've, I've heard enough people getting jaded, though. You know, but yeah. <laughs> I'm not jaded either yet, for for that matter. But uh, I, I feel like it's easy. It, it's easy if you're just working with metal bands to occasionally get a little jaded. Um, there's there's a wide range of uh, professionalism throughout. You know, because if someone's a, maybe they're the most amazing riff writer. Uh, right. most amazing drummer, the most amazing whatever. Uh, but maybe they're just kind of a kind of a tool when it comes to communicating with other people. And so, you know, that's that's something that uh, yeah, just gotta navigate. <laughs> yeah, it happens, and that's why you 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 make other friends in our community so you can vent about it and then be like, yes. hey. <laughs> they'd be like, yep, been there. I, know, I, just, I just made a post on my Facebook wall, like uh. Uh, uh, the other day, where I was like, "All right," because I got a lot of you know professionals on there, and like, "What what are your red flags?" I just want to know the red flag. And then uh, one of my other friends was like, "Wait a minute, I do like all these things." <laughs> like, what do you mean? Like, how how is asking for a tattoo a red flag? Like, it's the worst thing you can ask me, man. Like, because I'm not a tattoo artist. Like, like why, why are you gonna <laughs> ask the, the guy who's not putting it on your skin to do it? Like, they're gonna know what their abilities are they're gonna know what that what like, like you know let them do it and it's all wrapped in with their wage like with me you're gonna pay my fee then you're gonna pay the tattoo artist fee it's yeah. you're making it too expensive don't do it <laughs> yeah it is it is odd how many times i get asked like will you design my tattoo and it's like i'll do the loose sketch that the tattoo artist can interpret there you go that's, 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 a, that's actually a good all, compromise. that's all i would do because yeah. you have like you need to go with an artist that you're going to fully trust just like if, you know, you hired me for something, you'd trust me. Yeah. Uh, so what are the other red flags that the community said? Oh, gosh. I don't have it with me right now. Uh, what was the other one? Uh, gosh, there was a few that were. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, my, my own personal one is like, hey, c can you work on something for me? Like, I'll pay. Like. <laughs> of course. If they say I'll pay, it means <laughs> that they ha are in some kind of world where they don't normally pay and then this is the exception <laughs> and they probably think a hundred dollars is too expensive <laughs> and yeah. so i was like nope 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 ne never with those uh people that uh, complain about a deposit uh, that, that's another one that a lot of people came up with which is totally true i've had people write me in the past i'm like all right well i have a half down deposit and they're like oh i don't want to do that because the last time i did that the artist ran away with my money i'm like okay let's do, let's decipher that a bit you're getting a little bit worked up about this, so if I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if I'm gonna guess, <laughs> it probably means you're being a jerk, and you're being really rude, and they went as far as they could go with the deposit you gave them, and then they fired you. <laughs> they fired yeah. the client <laughs> because they were too much, uh, you know. And so, but yeah, that that part's not refundable, man. Like you're paying from a time. <laughs> so, and I have, I have, I have decided that my time of dealing with uh, your cranky ass is. Just about the same amount as a deposit for this piece. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's important stuff, you know, because I think in an ideal world, it would be nice if people recognize when they were being a bad client. 
And then also uh, celebrate the people who are good clients too. Yes. You know, I think that's oh, another God. part of it too. You know, oh, when God, somebody dude. is a good client, like really prop them up, prop their band up. And there's a good chance you might not even like their music, but if they're good people, like that's the most important I, thing. I will do that right now. Unleash the Archers, absolutely amazing people. Anyone who has a chance to work with that band should. They are genuine, kind, down to earth, fair, communicative, just chef's kiss on, on Unleash the Archers. I cannot say enough good about them as people. So That's awesome. Yeah. I, uh, me and my wife both like Unleash the Archers. Good band. Yeah. And so good you. Band. Let's show a little bit of their stuff real quick. Um, so you've done two covers for them, right? Yep. And including the latest one. Yep. All right. So you have any uh, stories of like kind of the prompt and working with it, you know, the time it took to create, just kind of general yeah. stuff like that? Yeah. So on this one, the, their album is a really, really heavy concept album on this one. Uh, it talks about this kind of like, AI robot named uh, Phantoma who um, is basically discovering the, the world of, of uh, you know, humans. And then the whole story unfolds from there. And uh, it's, uh, so they had a, quite an in-depth prompt to sort of uh, get the, the right feelings. They, they really wanted it to have, be a green, pr predominantly green, or, you know, uh, I, I worked in that kind of teal as well, but just blue and blue green. Uh, they, that was like the whole point because the first single was uh, which was called Green and Glass. So they really they really thought it was important to have this city skyline where these these like prismatic uh, futuristic buildings, mm -hmm. but surrounding them was all of this uh, beautiful lush greenery inside the dome. Outside the dome is a total wasteland. Like the Earth is basically you know well 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 into post apocalypse and. Uh, Yep, right here. This would be the interior art, and uh, so it's there's nothing. It's a barren wasteland, uh, and humans live inside of these domes where where everything grows beautifully. I used for the cover uh, Roger Dean as a, as a huge influence on this one. Nice. This, this whole prompt was way outside of my box. Like I'm like the monster guy. Give me tentacles and gnashy teeth. You know, I'm good. So when they started talking about a city skyline with lush greenery, I was like in my head kind of panicking a little bit because I don't believe in, uh, it's a lot of I perspective. Can't do this. You know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, that, that, that is the beauty of 3d for me. I am good at perspective. I am not excellent at perspective, but when you use a 3d software, like what I do, I can model in these basic skyscraper buildings set up my camera and bam perspective so, is solved. Yes. Yeah, so then you take a picture and then you paint over the picture. Is that kind of how yeah. it works? Okay. Yep. That's really cool. Exactly. It, it has been my little, I guess you could call it a crutch, but I like to, I like to imagine it a little more like, uh, using every tool I can, every ethical tool. <laughs> yes. Yes. Kids, kids at home, uh, every ethical tool, uh, at my disposable to make the coolest cover I can. I can do. I mean, I don't and, think it's a crutch because I saw, and I will uh, in post at some point, um, future Lee is going to put in, you know, some of the process vid of like sculpting and stuff. But I mean, dude, that cool. program looks complicated as shit. I it mean, is. like, yeah, because I'm like, oh my God, what does any of this mean? Yeah, Very no, it, cool it, to it, watch, it, though. it is. It's, and I, thank you. I, I, I'll be 100% honest. I, was worried for so long that people would not embrace my art because of the fact that I use a lot of 3D in it. I remember seeing a lot of people back in the day just constantly poo-poo on, uh, you know, 3D uh, artwork. I I'm just going to use, for example, the... I'm, I'm going to leave my opinions aside, but an example would be the more modern Megadeth album covers where the artist really 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 dials in the 3d model but that's just a 3d model with with rendering they, they don't paint over it as much as I, I can tell they might a little but i mean it's really crisp clear 3d models and you know people don't seem to really uh resonate sometimes with those obviously sometimes people do like it and that that kind of gets in my head sometimes 
it just kind of, I don't know. I, I, I want people to feel how I'm feeling about what I'm creating. And I feel nothing of excitement. Obviously people aren't always going to, you know, resonate or whatever, but like, I, I want that. And so I was worried for a long time that, Hey, maybe, uh, people wouldn't like this if they knew my process or whatever. And, um, I was really happy when I started showing more of the process type stuff online that people were like, wow, that's cool. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Nice. Nice. So, so all that shit was in my head. I'm an idiot <laughs> and <laughs> you know, just relax. And so that's, I've started to relax a lot more about that and not, not, not worry too much about that. Embrace my own process and embrace my own experience and, and stuff. So well, the, the, the imposter syndrome is everywhere, man. I mean, that's like, what from my perspective, it's, it's the opposite. It's the fact that I look at the digital tools and to me, they're actually a lot more complex. Uh, now I got my head around procreate, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I yeah. get that, but even Photoshop is a little much for me at this point. And then I look at what that is and I'm like, Holy shit, the learning curve, the amount of time it takes to learn all this stuff. So I think people can have their taste if they don't like 3d stuff, like they don't yeah, like the look totally. of it. That's fine. But like, dude, respect anyone who does that stuff because it's very difficult and complicated and, and technical. It, so, yeah. It is a lot yeah. more technical and I don't even consider myself much of a technical artist in, in, in the, in, in the gaming industry, we have roles that are like, you know, artists, junior artists, senior artists, and then, you know, art director, but there's also a whole role row for a uh, uh, technical artist. And then, and those people are like, they're, they're basically half programmers. I mean, they're, they're writing scripts inside of their languages or inside of their programs to, to do things for them, basically. They're writing little little codes to, to help out with their process and d design little plugins and everything. And I'm just like, okay, that's too far for me. But I mean, so they're they making show. Are they making the code because there isn't a within the program that other artists are working? There isn't a uh, a way of yeah. doing something. Is that how it works, basically? Yeah, they, they basically try to find ways to optimize their process so that it's okay. faster and it's a lot faster for if you, if you, if you've got the mind for it and you and you've got the you know knowledge of of code and stuff. I mean, why why wait for this programmer over in this other department to to figure it out for you when you can just do it yourself? I'm not that way though. I don't have that kind of programming brain at all. <laughs> not even a little. <laughs> but I but I do know enough to 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 do the programs, like to learn what, what they present as as in their UI <laughs> for me yeah. to use. <laughs> That's interesting, man. I I got one more question I can think of off the top before we get into showing some of the art, and I'll cool. refer to some of these other questions I came up with. But um, so right now, from your perspective, what is the most in-demand job in the video game industry? Like, what is the the role? Oh, that, like, yeah, what is it? Easy effects artist. Yeah, uh, uh, an effects artist because it's half animation. You know, because you got to be able to animate. You know, the explosions or the sparks flying off or whatever. But then it's also kind of techy and complicated. Uh, you know, you got to think about like the vo the velocity that the spark is flying away from the source. Like physics you know, we, and stuff. Physics, yeah, a lot of that kind of stuff. Plus, you got to be able to do the artwork itself. You know, the, the little little particles and sprites and all that kind of stuff, and to know everything. Uh, our job is always trying to find effects artists. And so, if you're ever if you're ever like, I want to be in the video game industry, and you're like, I want to be a concept artist. Hey, guess what? There's like 20 million people out there that all want to be concept artists, and then a, a, a video game company will only have a small handful actually on staff. And that's even if they aren't aren't just contracting them out, which they may. But if you want to get in on the uh, on that, you know, salary, and you want to get in on, um, you know, just 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 look for effects position. You learn how, uh, Unreal. Unreal will probably be a good start on um, uh, l learning a base, you know, effects system. And then you can build up your skills with that. And then you can take those skills to a company. The, the trick is to enjoy it because a lot of people do not enjoy making effects. And so I think that's why the position is kind of on the uh, sought after end because people get into it and like, I want to paint dragons. It's like, I don't want to do that shit. And then so the, the all the yeah. paint and dragons positions are over, but the ones of the people wanting to make, you know, need needing you know, every game needs effects. And so, you know, they end up, uh, in, in, in high demand <laughs> it's kind of back to original point of like 
you know, the just the overarching thing of like being exploited. It's all about supply and demand of like these types of jobs. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's very interesting. All right. Um, let me take a quick peek here. Yep, good, good, good. Well, I guess thinking your entire life, even what you're into now versus what you were into when you're growing up, I mean, who are like your four? I call it Mount Rushmore, and it's not like an original concept by me. I yeah, yeah. took it from some other podcasts, but it always leads to an interesting conversation. Yeah. Four artists uh, who are like your heroes, heroines, um, and just kind of inspire you to this day. Yeah, that's that's easy. I, I I've got two that I I'll start off with, and then I'll think about the other two while I'm talking. Uh, first one, <clears throat> hands down, uh, Wayne D. Barlow, uh, very very popular uh, illustrator. If if you've ever looked back on a lot of science fiction and fantasy novels, he of course uh, is also a concept artist as well. Uh, he you know people may have his uh, Barlow's Inferno art book where he uh, illustrated this uh, pilgrimage to hell. That that book I was into before because he also did the, 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 the guy I have all his books. Awesome. So you know, yeah, it's he was my number one influence growing up. I I had that uh, A to Z uh, guide of extraterrestrials or whatever, and uh, I would just flip through every one of those. Number one, I'd like I got to read this book because this thing's cool. So it, it got me interested in both reading and art, which you know when you're like. 13 i mean maybe 12 like i wasn't like super into reading at the time and so it just wow this is such a cool like alien or monster i gotta see that book i, I would you know read it and um so he he's he's number one his whole just aesthetic is amazing if you look at his uh concept art for like pacific rim or whatever and then you look at his stuff from like expedition his aliens from expedition art book mm -hmm. He has such a consistent style, but it's also he has a couple calling cards that that, that he, no he definitely eyes yeah yeah, uh, but it's all has a ton of variety, which I find myself sometimes uh, going back to the well a little too much. Like, okay, well, I've got the same tentacles on the face that I had in the last one, you know. Like, I, he seems to have be almost like a never ending supply of amazing ideas, and I think it's kind of worked so so well in that. Um, surrealist fantasy kind of world that 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 inferno art book world where you know hey th this creature has legs as, as big around as pencils a concept artist would be like this isn't realistic this doesn't work i don't like it but in his hell it doesn't you don't even for a second go that doesn't work it just it works because it, you know but when he's when he, of course when he's doing more like uh, stuff outside of the hell realm, you know, he, he's considering if something is, is possible or not. Um, that, that just really goes to, uh, yeah, he has a good blend of that, like logic and creativity approach to designing these creatures. And like, it makes sense too, that you'd like his stuff a lot too, because he's always exploring every angle of the creature, like a good concept artist does. So like he yeah. thinks very three dimensionally. Um, yes, he does. He's yep. a great he artist really to study if you want to get better at form, you know, and understanding yeah. like how something really truly exists and isn't flat. Yeah. So the next one would be Michael Whelan. No, no yep. stranger to the world of heavy metal at all. Obviously, Sepultura, uh, Obituary, uh, you know, the same cover that was used for Obituary. He also did some, uh, they, they use the same artwork for some uh, like H.P. Lovecraft novels compilations in the 90s that's where i first uh um saw that cover before i saw it for obituary but the first my first experience with michael whelan was uh he he had an art book around 93 or so just called the art of michael whelan it changed my whole world because at that point in time i was mostly just looking at comic books so a lot of jim lee which is of course an amazing artist everyone knows jim lee uh, also some you know other artists like rob liefeld you know, uh, those are the kind of things I was looking at, at the time, right? And so to see this guy who could just paint a perfect human form, a perfect landscape, a perfect monster, a perfect name it, it always looked perfect. It, it always looked so well rendered and it had so much atmosphere. And I just wanted that. Like, I, I have to be some something like this someday, whether it, where, I, I won't ever be this good, maybe, but I, I want to 
do that. I want an art book. I want to do covers for books, albums, all these things. I mean, I didn't even know who Sepultura was at 13 when I'm flipping through that book and I'm seeing that cover for Arise in the book. You know, and I'm just like, oh my God, this is the most mind blowing thing I've ever seen in my life. And that, and that, and that cover, I mean, I do that. Like, I mean, if you look, if you look at those uh, six feet under covers, you know, I, I, I like to take parts and and mush them together. You know, the way you get those like, you know, they had those kind of like lobster claws or crab claws or whatever they were on that cover, and they kind of just fuse into this other part. And you got these eyeballs. Like, I just, I love that that whole thing, man. You just had so much fun on that cover and to be able to do that but then to do something totally for lack of a better word just kind of boring just like a boring like woman standing in front of a sunset type stuff but still so captivating yeah where it isn't boring true master true master i i, I he's, he's definitely my favorite artist of all time he's just he's so good totally agree on both those picks um i think that's an interesting point too of like you could really name any subject and it does sound boring, but I guarantee you there's an interesting way to paint it. Yeah. If, yes. Even a yeah. cup of coffee, you could paint it in the very ordinary way or you could get a cool angle or a really good. I mean, for me, it, a lot lighting, of lighting, yeah. lighting yeah. is key. I learned lighting late in life. <laughs> when, <laughs> I, when I finally learned it, I was like, oh, OK, OK, this is kind of important. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, same um, here, man. Uh, so the ne- next one, I'm going to go with Gerald Brom. Uh, okay. uh, just, I, I, I bought a book. I was in a lot of art books in, in junior high and high school. And this is why I got on board with a lot of these artists. It was just called uh, The World of, of TSR. TSR being the company that owned the rights to Dungeons & Dragons before Wizards of the Coast bought the property. Um, and so it was basically a whole book full of just different artists for Dungeons & Dragons over the years. And Br- Brahm stuff was in there. Just, I, I mean, a third of the book was probably Brahm. It was, it was amazing. And uh, I was always impressed how he could do basically a T pose or a front on pose, and still like same, basically building off the same comment we just made. Like whenever, I, if 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 I paint uh, something just straight on, I'm looking at Brahm, going, how did he make that not boring? What did he do? that just makes it so amazing and interesting. And, and it is usually lighting and it is often, it's, it's rarely ju- just the pose though. He has some pretty amazing poses too. Yeah. But man, he, he really is the master of the like striking composition. One or two figures in a scene, a light, hazy atmospheric kind of background and just completely pulls you in. It's, it's yeah. phenomenal. Dude's dude's amazing. For the fourth one, this one I had to think about for a second, but I'm going to have to go with Alan Williams. Okay. Um, you know, do you know, do you know, what Alan Williams is? Uh, yeah, he did some work for Magic. He does a lot of those. Um, yes. uh, I have a, I have a book of his. Um, but yeah, it's like that kind of surrealism. Yeah, a lot uh, of like graphite. Lot of pencil. Yeah, yeah, graphite. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I love watching his stuff because number one, crazy monsters, crazy surreal monsters. Also phenomenally good at just the human form. So I look at his shit and I go, okay, how is he doing that with pencil? And it looks so real. I, Cause to be honest, I never had like a huge interest in high school. And, and by the time I got into the game industry, I didn't, I, I'm not really at that point spending a lot of time just like drawing a, a human form after work. You know, I mean, yeah. everyone says you should, you should do life drawing. You should do all, you know, whatever draw you know do your fundamentals but i mean you know not perfect i mean i went through my entire 20s and never did that <laughs> you know most of my 30s never did that i'm i'm, I'm mostly only now starting to kind of like okay 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 let's let's really focus on that but even then i would say uh, i let my figure drawing atrophy and i let my figure sculpting uh grow Right. And so that that's that's why I think a lot of times I am using the 3D software because it's e- it's easier for me to model a 3D figure to get my pose however I want it to be, you know, whatever. And then choose decisions that way and then paint over it whereas if I'm doing my, you know, circles and drawing everything like the way I, I w- usually would normally do, 
then I start being, I start hitting my quality bar and second guessing myself and being like, these fingers look stupid or, you know, he looks too stiff. I, I, I do that to myself a lot where I, I think I've made it look too stiff. You look at Alan Williams stuff and it, it's just, everything looks like they're weighted properly. Their, their shoulders slump where they should slump their their back bends where it should bend Their Their legs aren't, aren't, you know, if they're kneeling, they, they are in some weird position that is impossible unless it's supposed to be. Unless it's some weird alien growth coming off of the head or something, then it's all in that world and you don't even for a second question it. Phenomenal artist. I love him so much. Yeah, I agree with all four of those picks. Excellent. Cool. Well, let's get into showing some of your work. We've already done a cool. little bit of that. But starting with the latest Oceano cover, you know, we discussed it a bit, but... um. Anything else you'd like to add, or I guess like the concept and which which band member are you typically talking with? Uh, always the lead singer Adam Warren. Uh, okay. He's sort of the mastermind behind the band. I um, they've, they've had a lot of lineup changes over since their beginning, but they've had a more consistent uh, lineup um, more recently, and so um, that that isn't as much of a problem. But he's always been the constant. I think since. Beginning, not yeah. maybe day one, but at least at least from their first album, uh, he's been the the singer, and so it's kind of his band, and so I talk with him mostly. Yeah, I mean, uh, so like Oceano came out when I was in high school with the you know kind of original deathcore boom. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were always a favorite of mine. Um, at the time, like District of Misery, I'd play that song all the time. So, oh yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I mean, Oceano is a band I've I've kept up with, and um, I've always liked their art. So it's really cool to see that you're doing work with them. And um, I was like looking through Adam's Instagram the other day because I like watching him do like the vocal covers and stuff. And yeah, yeah. I also like was just reading and he was replying to people, but like he's pretty disciplined with like meditation and nutrition and like exercise and like yeah, uh, that that kind of stuff resonates with me a lot too. You know, always trying. To yeah, me better. too. Now uh, <laughs> I definitely had a, a, a long life of uh, you know the munchies. Uh, and yeah. so, uh, basically, uh, I'm working on that now and lost like 30 pounds over the past, uh, nine months or so. So I'm, 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 I'm getting to it too. Thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that too myself. And so, yeah, I agree with you is, is, uh, you know, reels and stuff like that are, are inspirational. I, 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 I never try to push anything on anyone. I only say someday if you act like I did, you're going to have your doctor moment. It will happen. It's not a matter of if it's a matter of when. And I had my doctor moment and it was like, all right, well, I have a family. Like, yeah, I got to be here for my family. I can't just keep, I mean, we're artists, dude. Like we sit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, 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 there's certainly like, there's, there's, there's some ripped artists out there for sure. I mean, most of us are not, there are lar- a lot of sedentary artists really. And so I know that was me sitting at work all day from nine to five, come home, eat dinner, sit, make an art. And then when I'm done, uh, uh, let's relax and sit some more. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> it just, just didn't have a lot of time. And so, um, it's, it's been, it's been good. And, uh, yeah, he's, 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 he's good for, for that kind of thing. When we were talking about this album, uh, it was, this was a tough one actually, cause, uh, he, he is a very artistic person in general in his mind. And he has a lot of ideas, but they're more like vague ideas. Like they're from his lyrics. He, if you even talk to him, he'll say that his, his lyrics are really open to interpretation though. He, though he has a specific for them, but uh, on this album, living chaos, he wanted it to be like, from what I understand, I mean, you know, what he told me that they were like, like more like chunks. A song would be more like chunks. Maybe this doesn't quite have as much to do with this or this. Right. But the whole album kind of paints a picture. And so um, that was also kind of that way with the cover. It was a lot of like chunks, little bits of lyrics, little bits of music that I would hear early and stuff like that. And then, you know, I, the only thing that was really kind of a mandate was that he did want the eye in the center and he did want, uh, you know, the, the crescent uh, front and center as well. Everything else was up for me to figure out what to do. What, what, what was living chaos? 
Uh, I did another version before this one that didn't quite make the cut where it had a little bit more like evil imagery. I know it looks pretty, pretty, uh, pretty gruesome or whatever, but like in general, a lot more monstrous type stuff going on. And, and uh, he was thinking, well, let's maybe let's reel back a little bit on that and uh, try to figure out uh, so, so, like some monster, but maybe something else is like, okay, well, what about a whole bunch of like arms and hands like intertwined with each other? Like, you know, they're all pulling at each other. And he's like, ah, oh, that sounds good. So that's where right. we end up playing with this one. Yeah, it brings out the more human and kind of relatable thing with all these hands and hands naturally are very expressive too. Like, we can relate to other people's faces, but you also can feel a lot from the hand. So it's a smart move. Yeah. Um, cool. So like with, with working with, with him, then I, you know, is that kind of like the, the good amount of back and forth where like he's challenging you and you're maybe challenging him and it, it's a little more like a collaborative experience. Like we're talking about, you know, bad clients, but like, I think it's also important for us to recognize when we're working with a musician and, they're not always like, yes, 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 but they're bringing something good to the table, like just the right amount of friction. You know what I mean? I think so. I, I think that is, I think that's a good way to put it. I, I, I do get a little bit uh, irritated um, sometimes you know, when I have to redo things, but yeah. it's, it's a personal thing. It's, it's, it's never something that I'm, uh, you know, bringing, bringing back to the band because, because, because my, my desire to make the client happy is more important than my disappointment when having to redo something. So I had to redo a little bit on this one, you know, and even then he was like, it's fine. We can definitely go with it. I don't like that. I don't like it's fine. You know, he, he was, he was never rude or mean. It, it was just, he was like, Oh, this is fine. I think, I think it'll be fine. And, I, and I'm like, no man, like we, we need to get this. So you're happy, like really, really happy. This is like your album. Right. And so, you know, I went back around and we, we did the, we, we did the hand approach. And uh, so I, I would say, yes, I, I think that, that that is the right kind of friction uh, back and forth is, is important. Like you, you, it's, it's, they're the ones paying you the money. You're, you're interpreting what they want. That's your job. As long as both sides are communicating, that is the most important thing. If one side is being like, nah, dude. And then they like, they, they, they fuck off for like, uh, you know, three weeks because they're on tour or something uh, th th then it then it starts to be like okay now, now i'm not now i'm now i'm not enjoying this at all because like i know it's gonna happen they're gonna get off tour and then they're gonna come out oh we got only one week to do this i can't believe this is done yet yeah. and so it happens like all the time and so um i think he you know he, he was good with communicating always, always has been we talk on the phone talking text talking email it's it's always been a good a good thing uh that's that's really good to hear Thank you for sharing that. So then this album cover, I think, is is very well known for Oceano fans. I think you posted, yeah. it's like it's you've seen over 20 tattoos of this yeah. type of, you know, cover. So, yeah. Can, and sometimes I'm like, take the neck, like the neck, like right here. I'm like, wow, <laughs> like, wow, that, that that is a weird. I never take that for granted. Let me tell you that whenever I see that, I'm like, it, it, it'll, it'll get me stoked for the whole day. I'll be like, all right, all right. Like I'm driving to work. Just like, <laughs> yeah. you know, cause it, cause it feels, it does feel good, man. I mean, it means that that person was vibing with that album, their music and my art at the same time in, in this coexistence that they felt to put that on their body for the rest of their life. Yeah. I mean, this isn't, I mean, you could say the same about someone who just gets a dock and tattoo in, in, in 1987 on their shoulder, but I think it's, it's definitely a lot like, like, you know, the logo, but like, it, it's, it's, it's a lot more, I think, personal when they go straight for like the album art, the illustration aspect of it. That That's like, wow, that's, that's crazy to me. Totally. And with this, what was this process like, uh, artistically technical wise, like what right. programs you use versus the previous one? Cause Right, so, quite so different this, looks. Yes, so the previous one is with my more modern style, where I'm I'm building it mostly in 3D, and then I'm painting over it. So every single one of those arms and hands is, is a 3D model that I've put, I've I've you know made you know these little fingers and 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 then I've and I've you know done these teeth and holes and all that stuff in in, in 3D, and then I bring it over in Photoshop and and I paint over it and smudge it. I use a lot of uh, smudging as well uh and okay. so then you go back over the, the other one uh this one was before i started using that process entirely so this one was was what i was talking about before where i use watercolor 
as a mm. base and it's not even pretty like i should have brought it i would have sh- sh- I held it up i don't have with me right now but it's it's honestly pretty ugly it's not, it, it's none of the colors that you're seeing there that's all done digitally um but it gives you the texture and the tooth and the and the grain from that watercolor paper and then the bleeding that happens you know with the water like that that all that stuff like you, you straight up can't get in photoshop um and so i i kind of loosely paint it as best i can get in the general shapes at this point i've already done the sketch so i know he's going to look like this you know kind of uh well just to do a quick tangent uh it's kind of meant to be like a fusion of uh religions like he's got kind of like a like a catholic kind of like pope kind of shape on this alien but then you've also got these like four or who is it six arms six arms Six arms. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you gotta it it. gave me a little credit. It's like nine years since I painted this, and I, I had to look at it a little quick. Um, and so, you know, and then, you know, you've got like a uh, different, like, you know, you've got Hindu religion and stuff like that, where they, where they you know, have the, the multiple armed. Um, I'm having a hard time with the name, and I don't want to butcher anyone's religion, so I'm just not going to bother saying it, but you know what I'm saying. And, uh, you know, so I, at the time I'd done a lot of research on different kind of like religions and stuff like that. They really wanted to, uh, have that, uh, like this figure represents this alien. That's basically what could have been the, the seed for all these different earthly religions. Like, okay. Could have, cool. Right. And so I, I'd, I'd already drawn it up. I already, uh, uh, sent off the band, uh, the, the early sketches and they dug them. And so then I'm just painting in watercolor uh, off on the side, basically eyeballing it. I'm not even doing like a shadow box or, or tracing. I'm just kind of like, eh, something like that. Some kind of thing like that and like that. And uh, arms out here, mountain back here, big swoop on top here. And then I, I, I take a picture of it just with my phone. Like I haven't used a scanner in a really long time. And uh, I just take a picture of my phone, but bring it into Photoshop and start painting over the top of it. But also preserving that texture from that watercolor image that I took. And then later on, after I painted it digitally, then I, I put that watercolor painting on the top layer and I, I set it to like, you know, one of the adjustment uh, layers, like, you know, overlay or multiply or screen or one of those, whichever one fits. I mean, I, I wish I could be more like, hey, I meant to do that, but I just kind of scroll down dun, 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 until, yeah. until it looks good. And, and then I'm like, yeah, dude, now I've got a digital painting with a watercolor like texture over the top of it, which roughly matches the thing that I've painted. And it gives it this kind of watercolor vibe, which, it, which I think looks really, really good. Uh, and it also kind of makes it seem like I'm better at watercolors than an ant, which is never a bad thing either. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, out of all the mediums you've ever experimented with, do you think watercolor is one of the toughest, or what are you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, you got to be okay with it uh, dripping and and spreading, and you have to con- control your water uh, a lot. I feel like yeah. with acrylic, as, as long as I've got that right kind of mix to spread the paint, like I'm I'm in the right place. And obviously, it's not one rule with acrylic, but with watercolor, I mean, you can you can almost glop it up a little bit like uh, acrylic in a way if you don't have much water. It's not yeah. that really what most people are using it for, but I mean, you can. But then when you add that water, it just whoa, it gets away from you. And so, yeah. And then your paper, if you maybe your paper gets like soaked if you're not patient. That's another thing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's love and hate relationship. That's for it sure. It is. <laughs> that's why I do the digital thing over the top, though, is because I, I think I have the patience and the, and the enjoyment. I do enjoy painting in watercolors, but after a certain point, I'm like, Okay, so I have watercolor painted today, and this sucks. And so <laughs> and now I need to bring it over into uh, a, a program that I'm comfortable with to make it not suck. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I do a lot of watercolor work, but a lot of it isn't. Uh, I end up using it as a base for mixed media. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It, it's actually kind of similar to what you're talking about, but it's all done traditionally. But like I was, yeah. dude, this whole morning. Um, I don't want to go on a giant tangent for myself, but I was watching a David Finch uh, live stream where he's doing mixed mm-hmm. media. And yeah. I was like writing down all the steps that he's doing. And I'm going to give it a shot uh, for this piece I'm working on right now. And it'll all be my own interpretation of what he's doing. 
Yeah. But like I haven't experimented with like matte mediums and gessos and stuff. So like that's kind of a new oh, territory yeah. for me. Totally. Yeah. I'm, 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 a, I'm always learning that kind of stuff too. So yeah. I, I, like, for example, I know next to nothing about oil paints at all. I, yeah, uh, it's one of the things I want to, I see a lot of my favorite artists like, uh, you know, Chet Zar using oils all the time. And, uh, I'm just like, Oh man, like that sounds like fun. I love how, it, how, how all the paint smushes and then it stays, you know, unless you're using a medium or whatever, but in general it takes forever to dry. So, so uh, I like that. I like being able to just leave it and like come back to it. Like <laughs> that sounds really cool. Cause you know, obviously acrylic dries so fast. So. <clears throat> totally. Oh, and then uh, just some more work from Oceana. If you had anything on these two. The, yeah. The revelation one was uh, almost kind of meant to be a spiritual successor to the ascendant. One. Like it, the story continued from that point. This one was like the aliens were not happy with our, what we've done to our planet and and they were basically re-terraforming starting over and then this one was sort of like uh, a chosen few were a- allowed to ascend up to the aliens and so i kind of had this deal where uh i imagined it were like maybe one 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 figure in a family was was chosen but then the others weren't and so you've got these people who are embracing their loved one who's ascending up to the uh whatever mothership or whatever you want to call it and uh you know but but then they're, they're getting raised but, you know they're getting completely obliterated from the terraforming huh. um the other and you one you see the crescent you know as well yeah continuation okay exactly and also this one was similar to the this one was uh with the watercolor and paint over oh okay yeah, the one on the right that was uh they were gonna do things a little differently um i think they i think uh oceano had some some personal things they had to sort out and, that, and so the the original um uh, time frame was it was supposed to be like like two two singles and then an lp and so i did two two uh artwork for two singles and then and then the lp you already seen the lp this was for the first single uh called mass produced this one was done with the 3d uh mixture that oh, okay. uh, i told you before uh, and then there's one more which will get revealed when when they uh, start sending out their uh, vinyls for Living Chaos, which okay. they didn't end up doing another single. They just used it for the artwork for the interiors of uh, of, Link, of Living Chaos. And so now th- this one will also be in there. So so that one started off as single art. Now it's part of the packaging for the Living Chaos album. Oh, and I, I forgot to ask, how did it even start with Oceana. Did they reach out to you or you reach out to them? Oh yeah. So a lo- oh, this is a good story. Uh, and actually it's, it's, it's probably a, a, a good, a good lesson to, to the younger artists here too. <laughs> and the older ones, if they've never had this happen. Um, after I did the six feet under stuff, I, I basically, I was kind of in for a brief period of time at metal blade. And um, so I think probably internally they were having some people be like, Hey, this guy just did the thing for six feet under. You want to ask him Whitechapel uh, wrote me and they asked me to do the album cover for um, new era of corruption, which actually I did not do that album cover that was released. And that's the story. I did a cover, a back cover and interior art. And I showed the band was loving it the whole time. Like they were, Oh man, so awesome. So awesome. I was talking to them on the phone. Everyone's happy finished everything and so I, I i sent sketches i sent i mean it, it wasn't like i just showed all these pieces at once but you know but everything was going through the band well i guess i don't know i can only speculate but because I, I really have a hard time believing it could be any other way i guess they weren't showing the label anything because when i finished i got the email hey man really sorry but label won't let us use this like why not like they say it don't they they say it doesn't match our our style it doesn't match the brand that they want basically i went too far into well i mean this kind of stuff really i guess like just too far they wanted like kind of like a half man half machine i mean what they ended up with with the album cover Mm -hmm. was the same prompt that i got but my guy was like just kind of sitting uh, it didn't have a lot of pop as far as like composition. It was just kind of a guy just sitting with like this mechanical claw or whatever. And uh, I guess I guess the label Melblade just 
didn't think it looked exciting enough or whatever. So they, they said, no, like that's not going to happen. We're not going to use this album cover. And so I was devastated as you can imagine, absolutely yeah. devastated. Uh, um, I worked a lot on those pieces and they ended up, they did end up getting bought by, cause I, I retained the ownership of them. Uh, so that they did end up getting bought by another band uh, called tomb of doom, I believe Australian band. But um, at the time they had promoted, they had already gone so far as to promote in the press release. Okay. New Whitechapel album, New Era of Corruption. They actually put my name in the press release, which is cool because, I mean, honestly, that never fucking happens. Um, but I think at the time, Oceano was, I mean, they're all, they're, they're, they're both deathcore bands coming up at the same time. And so I think they were like, mm-hmm. they probably saw the same, uh, you know, uh, press release. So who's this Dusty Peterson guy? And so I think Oceano wrote me from that because otherwise they would have no way of knowing who it was because they're on a totally different label too. Uh, mm-hmm. They're on Earwick at the time. And so uh, that's that's how I assume that was an assumption, but that's how I assume they found me because I can't imagine any other way they would have found me. And then been working with them ever since, really. Uh, yeah, very cool. Since twenty ten. All right, we covered that. Covered that. So we we have some. Uh, I wanted to show like a different kind of style and approach. Do you mind yeah. speaking to these? Yeah. So this is my like merch, black and white merch style. I I, I do this one because. Um, I don't know what it's like for you, but it feels like merch is like the price for merch. And it has been for over a decade. It's like 300 bucks, 300 bucks. Yeah. 300 bucks. I mean, everyone wants a shirt, 300 bucks. And, and so I, I, uh, worked, I did a t-shirt early on around the six feet under times for uh, cal decapitation. And, uh, re- I mean, I love Travis Ryan. He's a cool guy. And, and we talk every now and then. Um, but when he asked me, like, we were really informal about it at that time period. And he was like, yeah, do me a shirt. Like, all right, cool. So I did him a shirt. Like, awesome. So what do you want for it? I was like, I don't know. Like, it's a full painting, like 500 bucks. He was like, Shh. you just, just see him bristling. Just like, ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, man. And, uh, you know, he paid it and yeah, that was the last Cal decapitation shirt that I did. You know what I mean? <laughs> You know, you live and learn, like you live and learn if like you, if you're charging too much. And, uh, and that's just at the time I learned that I came charging too much. So, but then I go, well, how do I do merch? Cause I, cause, cause uh, honestly, I, I felt like 500 bucks for what I did was even possibly too cheap. Like for the amount of time, that that type I of work. Yeah. Yeah. For the full, fully illustrated, like fully painted mm-hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. It was a little much. And so I was like, well, what can I do? And so I came up with this. It's, it's a cool process. I basically, um, either digitally paint straight up, or I'll even, if I've got a couple like quick models, like on the Hoth one, I, I had made a, uh, skeleton model like a while ago for something. And so I just kind of took the skeleton model, placed it around in different poses, modeled out like a little sword, little head for the necromancer dude. And then I bring that over to Photoshop and I, uh, do the threshold modifier where it basically makes it black and white. And so from there I have now all the, all the, the hottest highlight spots are white and everything else is black. Like, well, that's not enough. So what I do is I do it in stages. I basically kind of, it's kind of hard to explain without a visual, but I basically use the threshold modifier in like 10 different steps. Each step has its own layer of like gray to white. And obviously a color, a shirt like this is, is a single color. It's white, right? So you can't have those different grays. So each step of the gray, I basically go in and I, I have a brush that kind of gives me a sort of cross hatchy look. Yeah. And then that cross hatchy look, I, I kind of match the tone, like a half tone kind of a, approach to each of those grayscale layers. And then I, I get rid of the grayscale, but I leave the cross hatch. So that, that gives me the, the different, sort of varieties of uh lighting that i need for these but it's also really fast because it's just a model quick threshold modifier some different i mean the only time i'm really like fiddling with it is with the cross hatching stuff that's all hand hand you know drawn in but it but it is a ha- a cross hatching brush you know what i mean and uh and then, and then so then that, now i feel like okay cool i have a cool looking black and white shirt and it's quick enough where I can keep it under that budget that 
everyone wants to use of 300. So I feel more comfortable um, with the time I put into it now. So it was, it was really about not bitching about the price people were willing to pay, but finding a way that I can still make cool stuff for people under that budget. That's really cool. Very creative. And we got another Unleash the Archers on the left. And then just, I don't know the story behind this badass piece here, but I love the angle and perspective. Oh, right? that's, uh, you're not, not, not playing Dark Souls, are you? I don't play video that, games. That is Gravelord Nito. He is, okay. uh, is uh, honestly kind of a pushover boss in Dark Souls, but he was <laughs> kind of one of the main looking, uh, like one of the main like looking bo- bosses that was in the initial trailer for the game. And, and when Dark Souls came out, I was just absolutely addicted to it. I, I, I turned off all freelance for like six months just, just to play this game. I never really <laughs> played any other ones because they all, that, and after that, they all feel too samey to me. Um, okay. they're all the same game and they, you know, they do take a long, long time to learn the boss encounters, but I, I don't do, I don't do fan art very often, but that, that was the one that I was like, all right, we gotta do some fan art. And, uh, very and obviously, that, you know, the only the archers one was cool. That was the first time they wrote me because they liked the Hoth artwork that I did and Hoth does really good on Bandcamp. And so I think Unleash the archers is also on Bandcamp, And so they saw my art on there and wrote me that was that was a really cool day man let, let me tell you i mean nothing will ever 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 not be cool about a band that you already like yeah you're already a fan of you already own merch you already own, you know and then they write you without without go you know um cold calling him or whatever that, that that's just a great feeling so that, that was the first one that i did for them on their ep uh, explorers and then uh i think a lot of people don't even realize the giant behind the ship yeah that was a little bit of a disappointment um my fault (laughs) my fault uh they always apparently have their logo at least up until that point they changed a little bit i think for the last album but they always kind of have their their logo based on the same spot and center yeah center and and top and i when i was doing this i could have easily probably snipped off some of the bottom um, hmm. I could have shrunk it and painted more bleed. I didn't. And so it ended up with the logo just slices off the top of the giant's head. And uh, so the person who just looks at the cover, they just see like a cool ship, which is cool. Um, you know, it, it is a cool ship, but uh, yeah, they missed the, the story. So that's, that's my bad. That, I mean, this was only what, 20, 20- 19 maybe I, I, i'm not exactly quite sure but it pre-pandemic, was pre-pandemic yeah yeah pre-pandemic um and so i mean just goes to show that like by that point i had been doing things for 12 years i'm still making amateur mis- <laughs> amateur mistakes <laughs> for forgetting to give bleed so it happens <laughs> bloodbath we talked a lot about that on the left and then uh this is the first time we're talking about like, is this an album cover then? I, I haven't listened to a ton of Hoth. I know the album yeah. cover is more of a landscape. Kind of yeah. like a, but is this another one? Of yeah, this is their second LP. Okay. Uh, Absolute Necromancy. Um, they're, they're local guys to me. And um, they uh, wrote me with their first album around 2014. And then this is their second album. And uh, they just... They're cool because they they're one of the bands that said do something that you like, but then they weren't paying the asses about it like at all. Like they they were just like, this is great, this is exactly what we wanted. And like while I do like we talked about the healthy pushback, uh, yeah. that's good. But every now and then it is really nice when someone's like, hey, can you make me something cool? And then you make something cool, and then they're just like happy, and it's just like wow, <laughs> perfect, like nice. Awesome. This is like how we'd all love it to be, but you know, obviously can't always be that way, but th- th- this one was heavily inspired. Like, are you much of a horror fan? Uh, I, I, there's a movie called the void that came out a few years ago. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm familiar yeah. with the movie, but I haven't watched yet. It's like on uh, my Amazon watch list. Well, if you like old school horror, I highly recommend it because, uh, it's, uh, they, they use a lot of latex and rubber effects, lots of monsters, lots of tentacles, good shit, good tone. And uh, I just watched it, and I was like, "Man, I want to make something like that." So th- th- there is a character in that movie that's, you know, definitely th- th- this this thing on the cover is roughly inspired by. 
Um, but I loved the the black hole face. I don't know. That that was a fun uh, thing to That's do. Cool. It was just a weird thing that I, I did the head first. I'm like, can this whole head just be the the cover? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it could black be. Hole head? Yeah, yeah, it could, it be. could have been. Yeah. yeah. Is this uh, sculpt and then paint process? This was possibly the first one that I did the sculpting with. Okay. Yeah, this one was definitely sculpted and then painted over. And um, I think some of the body maybe is still a little too sculpty. I really, uh, really like to take some of the 3D out of the 3D <laughs> and make it look a little more illustrative. So the, so the newer stuff, I, I really try to paint a lot more on top of it, use more textured brushes to give the, so I can get that paint stroke in there. Because right. we're talking about, hey, if you're into it, you're into it. If you're not, you're not. But like for me, like I'm utilizing 3D software, but I still prefer a painted, like, you know, traditional look. So right. I try to bridge that gap by uh, doing that. So this this one I love, but uh, uh, you can definitely see the evolution uh, with some of the newer ones where, uh, where I, especially the, it'll come up later, I believe, the Bigfoot one with the, for troglodyte. Uh, that one's a lot more, has a lot more buttery kind of strokes in it. And uh, that was because I really wanted that to be that way. So yeah. We can talk about it now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that one was also a pretty complicated series of 3D models. Every single thing on there, with the exception of the background apes, uh, was it was a 3d model at some point um I, and, and that just helps me you know it's like uh you know g getting the right kind of angle on this you know bigfoot eating some guy's arm you know it's it just really helps to get that all lined up and stuff and to compose everything and i just you know so some painted. people like you know they take reference of them doing that but you just built yeah. something huh. oh i used to do that too um <laughs> in fact uh the six feet under where the dude's getting his his whole body split open with the like summoner guy behind him. Uh, I call oh, it yeah. flex stripper. That one was, was originally a pose that I did for myself and painted over. And, uh, I started kind of feeling like, I don't know. I, I have little artist hands. These are not <laughs> me meaty hands at all. They're, they're dainty little, little artist hands, man. Like I, I started feeling like I, I'm, I'm making these like armored warriors. <laughs> and, and and stuff and, I, and he's got these little little hands on this thing i'm like okay i mean of course you know i could you know bulk it up but you know i, I don't know just uh i think I, I think especially when you were dealing with deadlines i, I was i was clinging too much to the reference and making th fingers too thin and stuff like that <laughs> uh, I, I feel you there troglodyte are they death metal band what are they yeah, they're they're a Kansas City based uh, death metal. Their whole uh, they've got kind of a gimmick where they they kind of wear like Sasquatch masks on stage, and all all of their songs are about s some kind of you know humorous take on uh, kind of mixing like seventies you know return to Boggy Creek kind of kind of aesthetic uh, for like old movie posters and stuff like that, and then just Sasquatch fun, you know, everything Sasquatch, so. Very cool. Here, and then uh, this one in the middle, that's the process vid you sent me, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I They made toys, bendy toys of Dungeons and Dragons when I was a, a kid. And so my, one of my, my favorite toy that wasn't a Star Wars toy when I was a kid was this bendy uh, Neo Atyug. And it was just the coolest thing. I, I mean, five-year-old kid looking at this beast with a giant mouth and these, te you know, love crafty and tentacle arms and these weird stubby trunk legs. It was just, it was too cool for me. It was that along with star Wars are some of the earliest points in my life where I'm going, man, monsters are cool. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, again, like I said, I don't, I don't do uh, fan art too often, but this one, um, I, I actually would love it someday to, uh, do like a magic card or something like that. And, uh, just really anything I mean, it's just, I mean, who, who hasn't wanted to do a magic card, right? And so uh, there's a little bit of a, uh, you know, a goal there with like, hey, you know, if, if, if everything I have is basically really gnarly, gross, you know, even further pushed Lovecraftian stuff than usual Lovecraftian stuff, it's cool, but it's, it's not exactly a portfolio thing that's going to get uh, an art director's you know attention 
mm-hmm. for a fantasy thing. And so um, this is my first one. It's kind of like between my uh, my my uh, my interests of right. crafting and monsters and Dungeons and Dragons. And so I picked this. Ne- ne- next, I'll probably do something a little more traditional, like just a dragon or maybe some. Uh, other uh, monster manual monster that's uh, a little more humanoid in some way, but uh, I really uh, was the goal of this one was just trying trying to get uh, some some stuff in my portfolio that would maybe get get some Wizard of the Coast eyes on things. Cool, um, totally, man. And all these three here are like personal pieces, right? Or this uh, like yep. insectoid kind of creature there. I know it's kind of cut off. If you guys want to see the the full images, I mean, please of course follow Dusty on Instagram. It's Croaking Demon. Um, just the slide deck thing made it easier this way. Uh, and I'm keeping an eye on the time. We've talked a lot about these. What about the Lamb of God commission here? That seems like it was oh, a while, yeah. while ago. Oh, damn! Like, see, I always feel like I'm just about to crack through a certain tier. And and this was one of those times where I was like, it's happening, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, I got written by the, 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 their band that's big enough where they, they don't personally, uh, <clears throat> you know, write artists. They have a middle management uh, uh, ad, ad agency type of um, merch company or whatever that kind of does it for them. And uh, historically, I am terrible at that shit. Like, ter- I, I'm good at like cold calling random people, but I'm not good at schmoozing i guess like i i i don't uh i like stepping on toes and i don't like i don't know making people feel uncomfortable with stuff so i'm not going to be like hey I, s- I see you're working for lamb of god how do i get in on that like uh i don't know that just <laughs> feels kind of feels kind of tacky to me so i just don't right um in this case they the, the this company wrote me <clears throat> one of the f- cases where instagram absolutely worked in my favor at the yeah. time, I was doing lots of the lots of merch designs, and so a lot of my tags were like merch, 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 blah blah blah. And they wrote and said, "Hey, do you want to do a thing for Lamb of God?" And I'm like, "Sure." And uh, it was this, it was it was it was the the risk kind, the kind where you know, like, do up a couple designs. Here's the here's the specs. Yeah, let we'll let you know if we choose it, and then if they choose it, they pay you. So it's not a contest. It's you know, but it's still farming you out really. And, and so in, in the case, both my designs did get chosen and they were 300 bucks a piece and all was great. And I was like, this is fucking awesome. I got to see a little bit of, uh, the band's like personal feedback on the designs. They basically like were kind of forwarded to me or whatever, which is cool. Um, then after that, that person at that company quit her job and went to a different company. And so I lost my contact with that um merch company mm-hmm. try try tried writing them a, a, again oh no uh yeah we are and i think i'm running out of battery damn so uh, w- w- we have a little bit of a tighter schedule i'm running out of battery dude uh i'll start over um and and so they uh um lost that contact and i wrote the company again and they were really wishy-washy and couldn't give me any real answers so yeah uh, lost that one, but I did get a cool Lamb of God, uh, two two cool Lamb of God uh, t-shirts that were in Hot Topic. So that was fun. That's a big distribution. Yeah. Um, yeah. How low are battery. you on battery? What's the warning For, on it? Uh, it's four percent. It's going to die soon. Like uh, my my battery's been dying. It had ninety six percent when okay. we started, and it kill it went that far. So all yeah, right. I'm sorry. Well, hold on a second. Let's if it's all right with you. We can also continue it later, like uh, like uh, maybe like another day if you want to like put mine on the back burner and do another another person's or something like that. We can I can finish up the interview um, another weekend or something. Oh, no, I th- I think we're pretty much there. Look, okay, if it's all right with you, um, just like final piece of advice for like okay. artists who are trying to get up and and running. Okay. Uh, final piece of advice is just number one, don't give it give up. Number two, drop the ego. Number three um meet people just like it's okay S- send friend requests to people online but you know send them a message first don't just blind hey bad friend like send a message like hey man i really like your art like i'm just kind of hoping maybe we could uh like i could see your art on my feed man like i really respect your work bam you got a professional that's now on your feed and 
if there's someone like me, they're going to be happy to help you with more uh, specific things in the future. Excellent advice. Well, for everybody watching, please follow it's Croaking Demon on Instagram. Dusty Peterson here. This is a ton of fun, dude. Definitely got to have yeah, you back man. on sometime. Had a great time. And uh, great advice for for artists of all sizes. Uh, definitely a lot of things I'm going to be leaving with too. But for everybody. Please like and subscribe if you don't mind. New episodes every Thursday, if not more frequently. See ya.